China gets to test Western resolve and deplete Western resources in the, in the Russia conflict while they buy time to take the Taiwan target. And by the time they take the Taiwan target, the resources and the will of the West have been drained and tested so the Taiwan target goes even faster. And now Russia's expanded, China's expanded, and they're a partnership. We're sitting here in the end of September 2023. The next election is November 2024. When you were on, on well, now the Danny Jones podcast, number 127, <laughs> on, I guess, like March 27, 2022, so that's a while ago now, that's when you first said, yep. in the lead up to the 2024 election, China's going to take Taiwan. You'll see China make a massive move on Taiwan. It sounds like you're a thousand, per, you're I'm even more all strong in. about that I'm now. All in on that. Absolutely. What is that move going to look like? I never said it was going to be warships invading Taiwan borders. Roll the tape, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> For real. If we have it, I would love to see it. I would love to see exactly what I said. Because I, cause I'm still saying, tape. I'm still saying that what we're going to see is we're going to see a massive move. That move could be a political move like they did in Hong Kong, where all of a sudden they just export all of, Ta all of Beijing's laws. Yeah. What, what happened there in Hong Kong? The short Side memory. Note. The short memory. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So so there was basically a turnkey uh, over like the preceding three years from 2016 to 2019. Beijing started exporting their legal code and codifying it as Hong Kong law. Ah. So then the protests that happened in Hong Kong were a response to the fact that Beijing laws were now enforceable in Hong Kong and the people didn't vote for that. Right. So that's that legal approach is they've been doing that in Taiwan for probably the last 10 years. How, but like, obviously the legal system in China is way f different than ours. But Correct. like what, if you had to explain it to a fifth grader to get across like how it works, other than the obvious of Xi Jinping decides what happens, like, is there any like real court in China? Is there anything that's not completely decided from the top or is it exactly what it looks like? It's not from the top, technically. It's from the Communist Party. It's from the CCP. Okay. So the party controls everything. Arguably, the party controls everything here too. Definitely. It's the Democratic National Convention or the Republican National Convention that dictates everything. Every opportunity we have comes from one of those two conventions, parties. Okay. Right? So China has a communist party and that party runs the policy and the legal infrastructure for everything that happens in the country. Taiwan is considered by most of the world to be a part of China already. One country, two systems. One China Danny over here agrees. That's the way it's been for I a long time. I think you made fun of me for saying that one I day. did. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I never, you're on a podcast with Ryan and, and you're like, I'm watching it like in the That was Ryan Tate. God, you guys And, and you're like, memory. yeah, I never thought of Taiwan as its own thing. I just always thought that was China. I'm like, Pfft. yep. I'm like, <laughs> that is the formal policy of most countries. The countries that don't agree with that are like little poor countries that, Whatever. I don't think there's one major developing nation that recognizes Taiwan. Not one. Right? So what that means is that the, the Chinese system gets to run independently. They have their own president, right? They have their own voting process, et cetera. They have their own military compulsory service for four months. Is that what it is? <laughs> what does that, what does that military? mean? Yeah. Ahead, compulsory exactly. service? It means that every person in Taiwan is forced to serve. Oh, got it. Got it. But they only have to serve for four months. So that's just basic. What do you learn? Basically. How to load a gun? So they train. Yeah, the train. They don't, have, they don't have enough guns. How legit no. is Taiwan's military? Not. <laughs> it's not legitimate, and there's no pride in the in military either. So <laughs> here in the United States, we have a great deal of pride in our military. Do we? It's not that way in Taiwan. I think we have a lot of pride. You should oh, see yeah. some of the we shit that Jack Murphy's posting. What do you mean? On, go, if you go to Jack Murphy's Twitter, he's talking. He's showing some of these like things that are going on inside the army and some of these bases and these people like. You saw the video. What was there? There was like some army guy. They were like having a competition, sucking a d or something. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That oh, was months geez. ago. He posted that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but, yeah, Maybe but like a month I, ago. I think what Andy's more referring to, like Jack reports. That was a great podcast you did with him, by the way. But Jack reports on a lot of stuff happening within the military because he comes from that world. It seems right. like. Well, Whereas <laughs> I, I think what and correct me if I'm wrong. I think what you're referring to is like how our national people look at our military yeah, still right. and, it, and it's regionalized yeah. too still yeah, i mean you know but i think the thing is um our re our recruitment numbers have consistently been brought down yeah. because we cannot attract people to go in yeah mm -hmm. right and that's that's the country's fault along the way i mean we've done some stupid shit 
with our military. We've not paid them well. We've not treated them well. Yeah. Uh, the lack of respect yep. in certain areas of the world, of the country. But I think that is the whole reason. We have to, you know, we have to bring in some folks that are not as great. And at the end of the, at the end of the day, we still have a professional standing military. Absolutely, you don't get a professional standing military from four months of compulsory service. No, so in Taiwan a small country. doesn't yep. have that. Yeah, exactly. there's no esprit de corps. There's no right. there's it's no just, believing their. Yeah. Their so if team. you can so if you can imagine, China for all we know, because none of us have none of us have the ability to even look at the legal code in Taiwan and understand how it's different from the legal code in Beijing, right? Taipei, Beijing, two separate capital cities, but we don't know where their legal code overlaps. And it's going to be in Chinese, simplified or traditional Chinese, depending on which country you're talking about, mm. right? When you get there to see it yourself. For all we know, the legal code has already been changed there, just like it was already changed in Hong Kong. Yeah, And it's just going to be a matter of one policy that Xi Jinping passes, that the CCP passes, that says something like... Now all members of Taiwan are hereby required to register as state members of China. And then there's going to be protests or whatever else. What China can run a blockade and just cut Taiwan off from the rest of the world. They can do uh. that. They can do that without ever having to set foot on Taiwan. Right? They can they can create air dominance over Taipei, mm. over Taiwan. Just by Aren't they flying. already running tests over that? Exactly right. That's yeah. what they've been doing for the last two years. And they're building some crazy, never before seen, like massive aircraft carrier, I think, right? They're trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying. They have they have the largest aircraft carrier fleet second to us. And they have the, the world's newest aircraft carrier that's right. out there. But technologically speaking, at, well, I think technologically speaking, they have technically the most advanced aircraft carrier, but none of their aircraft carriers have been tested in combat, which is mm. where they stand different mm. from us. Hey guys, can I ask you for a quick favor? If you look at this chart to my right, you will see that around 85% of our viewers for the month of September were not subscribed to the channel. And unfortunately, what that means is that YouTube will not put our videos into the algorithm, and therefore, we will not be able to scale this show and continue to give you not only great content, but give you more of it. I'd love to be able to hire a team, have some more help around here so that I can put out more. And if you guys take one second to please hit that subscribe button right there, it will go a long way to helping. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the show. But they also do have like there there was a story that went around a few months ago. I don't know if Steven can find this, but they had to install inside of their military pilots, inside the helmets of their military pilots, they had to install explosives that could only be handled by the generals on the ground oh because too many of them were deserting. And so I look at China and like you talked you had asked the question a little bit ago about like how they look at things in the future, and you were saying positively, and maybe across the people, I, I believe you. But when I look at their military, some of it seems like a little bit like a joke. Like they don't have, they don't have anywhere near the capabilities or the the bought in ideology that most of ours, if not like all of ours, has here. This uh, is insane. What is yeah. the source on this? In That's recent no weeks, users on TikTok have been sharing oh, look, content. Look at the top. Look at the top. It says false. Yep. What's this from? Logically.ai. Fact check library. This is the problem. Can you find it anywhere else this was published? The fact there is no evidence to support the claim that Chinese soldiers are being equipped with self There you go. The fact there's no evidence to support the claim that Chinese soldiers are being equipped with self destructing helmets. Uh, so that's how easy uh, misinformation can be. Bingo. Okay, yeah. That is exactly how easy misinformation can get out there. Is this the only article that published this? Uh, there's a lot of weird ones. There's like Asian markets. Can you go back to Google? Let me ask, let me ask you something. Let me ask you guys something, right? Intel 101. If you are negotiating with a foreigner and you speak your language fluently and the, the target's language fluently, but the target only speaks their own language fluently. Who has the advantage? The they do. speaks two languages. They do. You do. Why don't they? Because, because they you can decide can, it's, on, it's on their terms and you're not as strong in their language. You have fluency in both. You have fluency, yeah, fluency in Fluency or languages. like actual full-blown command as if I grew fluency up Fluency is fluency, it. man, right? If you speak two languages fluently, and your target only speaks their own language fluently, and you speak their you speak their language fluently and your own language fluently, right? Mm -hmm. Then that means you can control what information you say to them out loud, and you can control what information they don't understand. Okay. But you can still say it out loud. Okay. What China has over us is that they can write like this in English, 
and post it on English language servers, on English language newspapers and English language apps. And we read it in our home language and believe it to be true. Meanwhile, the Chinese people never see that in their own language. Ah, uh, yeah. So now the whole world thinks the Chinese people aren't even faithful to their own military, which is a complete misdirection. And it's on TikTok too. Yep. Think it's on TikTok? It. Yeah, there's, so there's TikTok videos talking about it. That was the opening line of this, that, this is, that article. This Ooh. is the age of information, right? This, Find the TikTok video. This is what oh happens when you control the information that other people see. And what we're stuck in the middle of is a giant information war. There it is. Look at this. Oh Son God. of a bitch. There's, There's a lot that. of them. Look. Who controls that? You got to click the little... Uh... Equipping their soldiers with helmets that have a self-destruct button. Oh. Let me repeat that. Chinese soldiers stationed in Tibet are being issued helmets that have self-destruct buttons. You press the button and a bomb that's embedded in the helmet goes off and kills the soldier. In fact, Chinese state-run media published an article bragging about these new helmets, writing, quote, if a soldier is seriously wounded and doesn't want to be captured, he can activate the self-destruct function himself. Pause this. To maintain Pause his this. Yeah. Pause this. What? Hold on one second. Chinese state-run media <laughs> issued the article. What, what language is that in? Thank it's you. in English. English. <laughs> that's good. Wow, that rewind that like 10 seconds? No, Andy, that was Article good. bragging about these new helmets, writing, quote, if a soldier is seriously wounded and doesn't want to be captured, he can activate the self-destruct function himself. This can maintain his dignity. However, the soldier is now the only one who can activate the function. The report also mentioned oh. that a commander who oversees the soldier can activate the helmet as well. Amazing. And so what's the reason for all this? Well, the Chinese Amazing. military has been, over the last several years now, struggling with soldiers deserting. And thus far, they've been using severe punishments against deserters, such as banning them from public transport, banning them from attending school, from operating a business, and even from getting a passport. And now they will be forced to fight, or otherwise they will be killed by their commander. <laughs> When an authoritarian country wow. wants to punish a deserter, do you think they just take away their passport? Exactly. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to be able to travel. Your whole yeah. family yeah. will Is be dead. shamed. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Shot and killed. That's um, that's about as good of a live like mic drop as I've seen on dude, podcasts. Amazing. It's super important that people understand this. It's really important. Like when when FBI and CIA and and CISA, this the counterintelligence security group of the of the nation, when they come out and they say that mis and disinformation are being spread, they're not just talking about Facebook ads that right. have a racially charged slur inside them. They're talking about stuff like this. China can produce misinformation in English and in Chinese and in Russian and in French and in German and because that's what they have focused on. We don't do that. We don't. We can do that, but the problem with us is that we don't have the foreign language fluency that other countries. Our government have. doesn't, though. Come on. Right. No. Nobody in the CIA does. Nah, I don't no. Think no. That's no. No. Argument. Hold on, guys. I said we don't have the the same level that they do because guess what? The whole world speaks English. Yeah, but we we have people who speak every language. Dude, you know? five right? people speaking Chinese can't keep up with. 50 Chinese people who speak English. They can produce 10 times the amount of content than these five people can create. Oh, you're talking about volume. I'm talking Rather about everything. I'm talking about I'm talking about quality too. Because guess what? A Chinese person who speak who's been teach who's been learning English since they were 5 is going to speak English in a superior level than an English speaker who's been learning Chinese since ninth grade. Mm. Yeah, this is what I was confused about on your fluency question, by the way, because that's kind of what I'm getting at. Because the ninth grader may speak it fluently now, but they don't have the the pizzazz with the language, the little intricate things. Like they the can nuance. be fluent, but right. they don't have the little yeah. nuances. My, but I mean, boil all those. Like I, I totally understand the details. I totally understand the nuances there, right? If you boil it down to its simplest level, they have 1.3 billion people. I'll bet they frankly have three people who speak English for every one person in the United States who speaks anything oh, other sense. than English. Right. And that's not, a, not speaks Chinese, but yep. speaks anything other than English. So what's that, the ratios? That's insane, Yeah. right? That's how this kind of stuff, and one article, like if you think about it, right? The 80-20 the, the rule tells us that for every one, every one, for every 10 things that you create, only two things will actually make an impact. So we just watched one English language article created by state-run media that went up on TikTok. That means 
according to the 80-20 rule, nine other things were created and just didn't go anywhere. It's not like mm. they created one article that was fake and that one article that was fake hit. It meant that they created 10 articles and that one article hit. Well, at least they're also fact-checking the fact because it came from state-run media. So they're fact-checking. That's 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 a positive. They're fact-checking yeah. over something from yep. companies yep. over-regulating yeah, themselves. Yes, we see so many problems with like fact-checkers and stuff like that. But in this case, they're fact-checking a foreign government state-run mm. arm that's a dictatorship who's trying to put out information. They're like, there's no, there's actually nothing good to support. Well, TikTok's not. Shout out to Google. Logic, TikTok. TikTok. Logically, I'm saying the one we looked at. Shout out to Google. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Google did something good. Yeah, Google Shout did out. something good. Exploding helmets. That's amazing. And how many how many idiots will watch that and say, "Holy shit! I'm glad I'm not in the Chinese." Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, We're gonna kick their ass. They're them. all deserted. Hey, you know what? You didn't come and give me lunch. Bow. <laughs> I read it. I read it and had it, video or not. I read it and had the same exact reaction. Yeah. Because I'm like, because then also in 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 fairness to me at least, like. You do look at their military reach around the world, and part of this is is talking with other guys in the military who mm. have had similar commentary on not about the exploding helmets, but on the lack of talent within their military, oh, which yeah. I can't speak to. They can, you could, but like they're like, look at our military bases around the world. We'd wipe them off the map in a day. Now, do I like thinking? That's an exaggeration. Number one, let's be clear. Yeah, yeah. But do I like thinking? Like the guy who, oh, those are the famous last words of someone who's about to lose. No, I don't. So I don't want to treat it like, ah, f them, paper tiger all the way. But I also want to be like a little bit of a realist and, and be, a, I, I don't know if it's like give ourselves credit for certain things, but also look at it like, hey, we, we do have the ability to f up if we had to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do. The, the, the question here isn't who would win. The question is, do either sides want a war with each other? That was the question that That's got That's the original down. question, yep. yes. And, and the answer is no. The United States does not want a war with China. China does not want a war with the United States. That doesn't mean that war won't be the thing that changes the economic Correct. power uh, balance in the future, but they don't want a balance. They don't want a war with each other. The, the real question, the place that I can't wait to have answered in the next 12 months, 14 months, right? When the election, election is November, 2024. That's the window. We're inside the window of time now where China has to make the decision. Do we move on Taiwan now when America is broke, divided, confused, and distracted? And that's just the president. <laughs> <laughs> do we move on? Do we move on? Do we move on Taiwan now or do we wait and see what America is going to look like? two years down the road, five years down the road, eight years down the road. If I'm in Xi Jinping's shoes, probability wise, the high, the probability is if, that we would, that if I was in his shoes, if, if a trained intelligence operative was in his shoes, he would move now. He would move in the next 14 months. That doesn't mean he's going to invade. It could be a blockade. It could be a legal struggle. It could be who knows what. It could be a, a sudden death of a leader. Who knows what it might be, but you would make some kind of very aggressive fast move to take control of Taiwan administratively more so than militarily, but you would make a move to ingest that in, in a, as peaceful and as productive a way. Cause you, if, if you destroy Taiwan, then you destroy all the value of Taiwan. Mm. So it doesn't make any sense to go in there and bomb the shit out of it. They want what it has, right? So they want to take yeah. control of it in a peaceful way that preserves the infrastructure. The same thing Russia wants to do in many parts of Ukraine, right? So that it's just, a, it's a simple question. You've got a 14 month window now with a high probability of success, or you wait another 20 years, another 25 years, another 30 years. The reason that I really believe that the 14 month mark, the 14 month window that we're in right now is so critical is because of the commitments that the party has made to the people with their 2050 plan. Because inside their 2050 plan by 2025, they want to have technological independence from the United States. They don't get that unless they have the semiconductor capacity of Taiwan. Are you sick of the coffee jitters from drinking it too many days in a row? How about that dreaded afternoon crash? Well then listen up, because I have an amazing on-the-go drink for you to try. Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative containing four adaptogenic mushrooms. Big words, because they're really cool. With only a fraction of the caffeine of a cup of coffee, you're still gonna get that all-day energy without the jitters or the crash. And by the way, each ingredient was added for a very specific purpose. You got cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and a tasty 
healthy hot chocolate-like flavor, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. All you gotta do is take a scoop of mud water powder, drop it into hot water, stir, and get on with your day. Personally, I love how you can drink mud water straight up or mix it into your favorite smoothie. Gotta have options, baby. So what I need you to do is go down and click the mud water link in my description, and at checkout, use promo code JULIAN to get 15% off the best coffee alternative you'll ever find. Once again, that's promo code Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N, at checkout to get 15% off your own mud water today. And by the way, they're going to throw in a free frother as well. Everybody wins. Now let's get back to the show. Now here's another question, mm-hmm. because in that last point there too, with the semiconductors and stuff, you're talking about the supply chains, which is very fascinating because that you don't even get to some tech if you don't have the supply chain availability to build it. But you've talked a lot on camera in the past and off camera. I know we talked about this weekend already and you've talked it about it as well, Jim, about the, not just like some of the incompetency in places you never expect it in government, like the public, we would never expect it, but also some of the lack of like technology you have mm-hmm. in certain seats or like a little bit behind. And then at the same time, we have things like our friend DARPA right there Shout where we know, well, we don't even know exactly what they're doing, but we know they're doing, ins- and this is a government arm, doing insanely high-tech things. And so looking at China, since 2000, I, I know Kai-Fu Lee wrote an amazing book on this called like AI Superpower or something like that. We'll have to check that title. But he's a venture capitalist who is a Chinese-American and has lived in, in both places. And he's talked about how in the year 2000, China was like borderline third world country in tech. And by the headed up into 2020, he wrote the book in like 2018, I want to say. The the Chinese superpower of tech was now coming up and evening things out with the United States again, because they also stole a lot of our IP. But is, is there also the idea that since they're not innovating as much, they're definitely innovating things, but they're, they're mostly taking at will the innovations of other countries and building upon them, is there also a pretty good argument to say that there are things behind the scenes in the government, in companies paired with the government who are here, where we have so much shit that they're, they're so far behind in the race they actually think they're winning? That's a very Julian Dory <laughs> <laughs> kind <What>? of self-satisfying <laughs> question there. So No, it's a serious question. I understand it's a serious question. So here's, cool. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask my law enforcement partner, right? If I told you that you needed to make a million dollars in one year, would you think that it's faster to earn it or steal it? Steal it in a minute. Yeah. yeah. And if, if I'm- Not arguing that. that You just answered your own question. Then. No, if I, if I no make but you- I'm saying, does DARPA, do, do things like DARPA have tech that we can't even imagine? For sure. Yes. yes. No doubt. Yes. That's far ahead of them. That's what I'm getting at. Is yeah. it? Because we don't know what their DARPA yeah, is. Yeah, we don't know where- Yeah, we don't know where- They, they had lie. Neuralink in 95. According to Andy Jacobson. DARPA. DARPA. Right. So we don't know what their DARPA is, but we do know that the only thing they've done is steal, which means they haven't made, or one of the only things they've done is uh, steal. The thing that they Most do the, the best. the only thing they've done. The yes. thing that they do the best that we know of is stealing. But so that part, means they're stealing from DARPA. Really? And of course Everybody. they're stealing from DARPA. They're stealing from everyone. And then they're stealing from the DARPA equivalent of every first world country out there. How would they steal from DARPA? The same way they steal from everybody else, man. They, they have... They, <laughs> it's term it's not, not helpful that most of your engineers, most of your computer engineers, yeah, and trained most of here, your you're trained, here, trained and, here and come from China. Yeah. Right? Like the, the vast majority of the Chinese intelligence cases that have happened in the last five years are Chinese nationals yep. that have gained American citizenship or were given American green cards to work in American companies and then took the American inf- IP and took it back to China. Right back. That's, you think that just happens in the United States? No, no. I, I was we've ta- we've that. talked off camera yeah. about a guy we know that it's happening to. Which so this, guy? Well, you know. The guy with, oh. Right. We, I've also told you about um, somebody who I know who wrote a book and has been turned into essentially like spy fly paper for other countries, including China, mm. when it rec- comes to the UFO stuff and some of that crazy super physical anomaly stuff. So I'm not saying that we don't have an advantage in terms of innovation. What I'm saying is probably the biggest advantage we have is ingenuity and innovation, right? That's what, that is a huge benefit that we have. However, when it comes to making a million dollars, $10 million, $50 million, if you have to do it fast, it's always going to be easier to steal it than to try to earn it, especially because after you steal it, guess what you can do? 
you can learn how to earn it on your own, yeah. right? So that's one of the advantages that they have. What yeah. do we do in response to that if they take Taiwan? That's the million, that's the way more than million dollar question, right? If, if they take Taiwan, it, if anything, the CHIPS Act that Biden put into motion tells me that he's kind of already anticipating they're going to take China, they're going to take Taiwan. What is the CHIPS Act the, again? The CHIPS Act is the act that makes domestic production of semiconductors inside the United States a priority that the government can earmark U.S. dollars for. Mm -hmm. Which means we're going to start making them in the United States. Why would we start making them in the United States? Because they're not going to be available <laughs> <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's like yikes! Oh, yikes! Oh, yikes! I mean, yeah. I mean, he he's he's predicted enough. I mean, he's, Biden's predicted this through actions in teleprompter. You know, <laughs> I mean, I was going to say his own words. It doesn't exist. Um, but I can't believe the Air Force Academy tripped him up at graduation. You guys, that was kind of funny. But seriously, like that's he's just. He's basically said like he did with Ukraine. Hey, we know they're going to go. Yeah. And that's, but go the problem go. with some of that is it's telegraphing your moves. Always. It's this also misdirection. Yep. It's also, it's, it's supposed to be both. You're not telegraphing your next move. You're telegraphing that you have options for your next move. Mm. Right? So we're telegraphing that we, we will start domestic production, but we're also closing massive military deals with Taiwan. So we're going to ship them more weapons. Mm. So which, which thing are we actually doing? Which one is our true bet? We don't know. Right? Mm. It's poker again. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. This is the that. sophistication of real policy, not mm -hmm. fucking armchair policymakers who sit around with a beer and a, and a bag of Lay's potato chips and bitch about what we talk about. Yeah. Real, actual policy professionals are always asking themselves, how do we create a narrative that does more than one thing at once? It appeases the American people and sends a message of encouragement to our allies and undermines the confidence of our enemies and leaves us space to change our opinion in the future. You That's know, not easy. You know what's interesting, though, too? And we haven't even mentioned this throughout all this conversation, but I, I don't know what to do with this. Go back four years, five years, something like that. You had the left wing of Washington, D.C. love talking all about Russia. The right wing love talking all about China. Ukraine war breaks out. Right wing gets on board talking about Russia. Over the past year, we've now seen the left wing get on board talking about China. In a world where we are so divided, we do seem to have both parties, not necessarily unanimously, but right, like right, right. by majority. On, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm saying it's very interesting that we have both parties supporting both quote unquote enemies. And we also have those two getting in bed together at the same time that this is all going on. I don't really know what to do with that, but that has been, if, if you're not looking at that the last three, four months, it's, it's painfully obvious now. I think it's encouraging, man. Yeah, I mean- We've got two parts of a divided country agreeing. I mean, you even have Nancy Pelosi traveling. That was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, when I mean, she went to yeah, Taiwan. 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 Yeah. You know, so you, you definitely, it, it, it's, a, it's a spot where we can unite when we can't unite on anything else yep. right now. And that's, I'm encouraged- as you are, that we're at least putting that out there, that yeah. we're a united front. Now, you know, if they when when they look inside and they're checking our intel services and doing the things that they do every day, which they're better at because they're committed to, you know, even even the stealing of proprietary information, they don't have any problem putting anybody here for 20, 25 yeah. years to do one little piece of that job. We Can you imagine? Can you imagine sending a, a Harvard student over, hey, you're going to China and you're going to fin It just doesn't for happen. For 15 years. Yeah. First yeah. off, it doesn't happen because you're so recognizable being there. Here, you can come on in, bro. You know, everybody can come in, go work at a major research facility, and and fucking you can take anything home that you would like to take home. The thing that's really important, and you're 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 grazing the top of it, right? The Trump policies against China were carried over by the Biden administration. Mm. Nobody talks about that. They mm. don't. They were adopted, rephrased, and expanded upon. You can see it in the executive orders. You can see it in the changing of the names of different priorities and policies. But the anti-China the anti -China stance that Trump put in motion in 2019, I want to say it was, 2018, has been adopted and expanded upon by the Biden administration. Yeah. So, it's pretty hard to argue. Yep. And, that's what, and you see that on foreign policy, both parties agree that that is an enemy. And 
they still try to reduce the attention of the American people onto that enemy because they don't want us to freak the fuck out. They're reducing it? How are they reducing it? The, recently, who, recently, not a year ago. Now. Seems like they're talking about it all the time. Who's talking about it all the time? About what, China? Yeah. They co- First of all, they changed their verbiage from separating or decoupling yeah. to de- or de-risking to decoupling, something like that, right? They're softening their verbiage. They're, it, you see it being written about more and more in foreign news sources, mm-hmm. but what mm-hmm. you still see American news sources focus on is Russia, Ukraine, domestic policy yes. issues. Yeah, yeah, that's Didn't still, Apple yeah. just say they were going to have all their new iPhones made in India instead of China? I don't know. I don't know. If I thought I heard that somewhere. Out, Maybe Stephen can find it. I don't know. But that's also, I mean, look, the COVID thing, if if China was like trying to take advantage of that after it happened, some of that did backfire on them because oh. people removed some of the supply chains from yep. China. Oh, yeah. That's, that's one of the big reasons that I don't subscribe to any of the conspiracy theories that China intentionally created COVID because- all it did is highlight that when they shut down, the whole world shuts mm. down. Mm. doesn't make any sense that they would highlight that. They've been working for decades to get there. They knew that before we found out, right? It's interesting. Apple is planning to move a quarter of its iPhone production to India by 2025. That's two years. This would be up from 7% in 2023. Apple has already tripled its manufacturing in India since 2021. Wow. Well, that's, a, I mean, that's, there's some tangible numbers there. Those are, yeah. And, but who's India allies with? Russia. And? Fill out the bricks. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Mm. B-R-I-C-S. How, how tight is that? I it's don't know it's as tight as that. anything else, right? They argue over border disputes. They're in close trade partnerships, right? They both buy tons of oil from Russia. So it's a, it's a pragmatic relationship. It's not based on ideology. It's based on pragmatic outcomes, right? So now India gets to partner closer with trade with China and partner closer in trade with the United States. What's to like, right. I- India sees right. that as a net win. Yep. China yeah. sees that as a net win. The United States is like, wow, we're kind of fucked guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> what are we going to do? Does nobody else really just abuse human rights? Cause we need an ally who abuses human rights <laughs> to do more manufacturing, but we made it so that we won't trade with you unless you respect human rights. Oh, we damn. Are, we are fucked. He's on fire. <laughs> yeah, he is. Wow. He's on we fire. Man, I love it. But that, I mean, that's not, that's uncomfortable conversation no one has out loud, yeah, it but it's absolutely the conversation. What you don't see, people aren't going to be upset about. Mm-hmm. But if they see it, meaning like, if it's fucking happening here, everyone will be up in arms, and that's just how it is. What's Saudi Arabia, Arabia's relationship with China? This is something I have no idea you guys are... Don't Much look at me. I, I don't know a ton about this either. The whole, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm totally riffing because I love I like this it. shit, dude. I know you do. Your, your entire um, Khaliji Arab oil rich area, right? Your UAEs, your Saudi Arabias, your Kuwaits, Omans, um, Bahrains, that whole center of the, of the world where oil comes out of the ground in the water, right? Where nothing but oil and fig come out of the ground. Right, um, that or not fig, uh, poppy, <laughs> oil and dates, oil and dates. Right, that is that was the first, probably most pragmatic place in the planet. Right, these you're talking about Bedouin Arabs who before 1955 had nothing. Mm. They had nothing. There was no natural resource in the desert until the. British came and found oil and then started signing deals with families to drill rights to their oils. And that's when everything exploded, right? 1970 something yeah. was when you really saw the Middle East transform. They are absolutely super pragmatic. They understand more than any of us that they have a natural resource and that natural resource has a limited time span. And when that natural resources time span is up, the whole world's going to leave them again because that's where they started. If you think about it, the same generation, like the same generation is alive today in UAE that was also alive when they had nothing there. So within one generation, your grand, your, our grandfathers are old yeah. enough to have seen the entire transformation of their country from sand to Dubai. Yeah. Wow. Fast. Fast. That's insane. So they know that as soon as that oil is gone, they're going to go right back to dust again, mm. which is why they're trying to find a way to diversify their investments. So their goal is to maximize the resource while they have it. 
So what's their relationship with China? Whatever is going to get them maximum resources, right? If you remember, the, the, again, ideology. What did Biden get elected on a campaign trail, of, a campaign promises about what with Saudi Arabia? Do you guys remember? It, no more, uh, no U.S. production. Right, right, So right. basically was just going to utilize then he had to them call, 100%. He yeah. had to like call like an or something after, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, his policy promises on his election campaign were that he's going to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for their human rights abuses, for their sexism, and for their, uh, their price jiggering yeah. with oil, okay. right? Mm. That lasted for about two and a half years until we sanctioned Russian oil and the world needed oil. And then he reached out to Saudi Arabia and said, hey guys, we need your help. That mm. wasn't even, that was just over a year. Mm. It was, yeah, it was super fast. That long. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. Complete reversal of the policy promises he had running mm. into office. Saudi Arabia was like, sure, we're here for you. We know you were talking shit about us two years ago. It's okay. We talk shit about you every day. Yeah. But we've got oil. You need it. And we know if China needs oil. We got them too. And right? I mean, look, they, they, there is a real grip there. They, they got sincere MBS in particular. They got sincere coverage on the Jamal Khashoggi thing. Okay. I mean, that was the most obvious, like killing a journalist on a foreign soil. Insane. And nothing happened to him. You know, the sanctions were minimal. Other nations just said, very, very bad, MBS. <laughs> exactly. Don't do that <laughs> again. He goes, yeah, again. bet. Okay. Yeah. But that it it just goes to show you, you said it on a podcast a long time ago, but it, it really simplified the worldview for me. GDP is the only thing that matters. GDP is what drives the world, man. Yeah. And, and every yeah. country knows that, and they learned it from watching us. Right? We were listening to a country music song. What was that country music song? It was Rodney Atkins. Yeah. Watching you. Watching you. Yeah. About the whole a kid watching his dad on the, both sides. The whole song is about a kid watching his dad and the dad recognizing that the kid yep. picks up his cool habits, but also picks up his bad habits. Yeah. And he's like, "Oh shit!" It's like an aha moment for dads. My kid's watching me. Who sings it? Rodney Atkins. Yeah, it's a huh. great song. It's a really sweet song, but it applies here mm -hmm. too because the whole world has been watching the United States. So the shit that we've done that works, guess what they're going to start mimicking? Guess what they've been mimicking? Yeah, 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 absolutely. The global war on terror was a war that we invested in and we forced our NATO allies to come along with us. You know who didn't participate in the global war on terror? China and Russia. <laughs> so what did they do for 20 years while we were balls deep in Afghanistan and Iraq? They built. They built, they regressed. hacked, they yep. regressed, they spied, yep. they stole. Yep. They did everything that we were too distracted to catch. Wow. And then we pulled ourselves out, pulled our heads out of our asses in 2022, and we were like, oh, shit. We got a problem. Surprise, surprise. You pull your head out of your ass and you see shit everywhere. <laughs> we we got a break for a few minutes because you have to do a phone call. Oh, so yeah. Let, let's, let's stop right there. We'll, we'll pick up. Social credit scores. Having Glenn. Yo, before you go into that, my buddy Eric Zuliger oh, messaged shit. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just messaged me uh, right after we took our break. And uh, he just said, yo, can I pass a question off to one of the guys you're in the podcast with right now? I have a, <laughs> I have a little bit of a Turkish problem. I got... <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Do you know the backstory of this kid? No. We'll get to it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The text. I got detained again and ran... I got detained again at an airport between Sarajevo... Sarajevo? And Sarajevo and Athens. And I have no clue who to talk to. Not getting detained again. I called the U.S. <laughs> Embassy and they were like, so what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Sarajevo. Who the fuck goes what to the Sarajevo? Fuck? What is he doing? He, he, said, he said, also, they took my phone for like two hours. So I'm assuming it's loaded with spyware. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just fucking want to see what your idiot is. You know, exactly. Erdogan rules. <laughs> Erdogan rules, whatever that well, means. Well, Andy, you should probably get rid of that phone, no? So yes. that phone was cloned. Yep. That phone's not covered in firmware or spyware. It's been cloned. Yep. That's that's been duplicated. That's things. Yeah, and it's and the numbers and the contact list and all that's whatever. He must fit a he must fit a pattern of life profile that Has that, to. that turned them on to him. Well, he Has was just to. on he was just on all, of our podcast. What's he do? Well, he's coming living? on mine, but yeah. What, yeah, what's he do for a living? Where Give else the has story, he Danny, been this detained? Is um, so he is a journalist who was writing a book on countries that don't exist. So he traveled to all those crazy all these crazy countries uh he was in he was living in turkey for a while where he was a kurdistan. teacher kurdistan uh some an, an autonomous region in lieberland lieberland somaliland somaliland i want you guys to picture if jonah hill michael Sarah, 
and Seth Rogen had a baby and it lived in Europe and traveled to a bunch of countries that aren't recognized. This is your guy. You mean like so? Is that a chunky white guy? Am I yes. Right? Yeah. Chunky white guy with red hair. He's got curly Almost. hair. Almost. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Getting he, detained in Turkey. He was detained. This is the once. second time he's been detained in he Turkey. He was detained once four years ago because they were on the or five years ago because they were on a train and they said, "Where are you from?" And he said, "Kurdistan." And apparently that was a big no no in Turkey. Oh yeah, because you yeah. said he was a, he te- he was a teacher in yes. Turkey and a teacher in. Kurdistan. Kurdistan. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons he's detained. And Albania. So, uh, first of all, I would- Now he's an Albanian wh- citizen. Where is he? F- okay. So, but he's from where California. Is he from? from California. Cali? Yeah. Okay. Is he a U.S. citizen too? Yes. U.S. Citizen gained Albanian citizenship? He went Correct. into the Peace Corps, which you would know something yes. about. Yes. That's how he ended yeah, up yeah, over yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't want him, apparently. Yeah. Allegedly. They didn't want him. Well, yeah. they want him now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would recommend a new line of work. And a new home base other than Turkey. This dude needs to be operating out of Spain, Portugal. Yep. He needs to I stop like going back and forth to Turkey for sure. Why do you like Portugal? Because you'll never fucking, never have an issue. Permissive. It's a permissive place mm-hmm. to be. If he's going to be traveling to shit, I mean, where he's going is essentially it's like wearing white pants and walking through mud. Got it, yeah. So then everybody sees the mud on the pants because they're looking at his pants. He needs to go to a country where they don't look at pants. Yeah. They look at shirts. Yep. Hmm. That's exactly right. We could still do the same work, but it will no mo- no more issues. But if you're an investigative journalist of any type, with a f- with experience in K- Kurdistan, where you are actively traveling in and out of areas of high tension, which is all of the Somali land and everything else, where and then you have a footprint as a teacher in Turkey, <laughs> that it, looks like a cover. And then you changed right. your fucking citizenship. If he's traveling in and out in the same name with two different passports, sometimes he's American going in and out, and sometimes he's Albanian going in and out. Like he looks super, super sketch. He was yeah, also yeah. In, in the oh, middle of a. Name. He was in the middle of some sort of big protest in Syria. Mm. Okay, <laughs> well there you go. So he's really helping. Yeah. The, helping stop his going. Cause stop quite a going bit. to Turkey. Yep. Stop going to Turkey. Go to Turkey. fucking. Ah. Go to Georgia. If what he's ah. looking for, go to Albania. Oh. If you want a cheap place to operate, if that's why he's that's in Turkey, he lives. he lives in Albania. Why is he going to? Why is he in Turkey? Because he's, you he's know, crazy. stop Talking flying Michael through yeah. Istanbul. What is? Yeah, what's the reason behind the Turkey Detain- detention? Yeah. He's one of those guys who wants to put his finger on the well, scalding hot coffee he, he's long enough get, just to see when it burns. Well, he's then he shouldn't be texting Dan. Yeah, he's getting. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing. If he's texting you with the phone, you should just toss yours out too. <laughs> 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 Fuck. Yeah. Son of a bitch. Yeah. And please don't uh, forward anything to Andy. <laughs> oh my God. It's probably some guy named like fucking Contour on the other end of that yeah, text. You're going to get something better. Here's like, what you're going to text this fucking guy. <laughs> oh my God. He shouldn't, he's though. So the good news is he shouldn't be in danger. No, definitely right? not in danger. He'll get detained. Worst case scenario, he might get detained for multiple days while an investigation gets carried out, but he's not going to, he's not going to come up with dirty hands. He's, there's no going to, there's not going to be any, you know, dirty laundry to hold him or put him under arrest. But yeah, his the, life is going to be very inconvenient if he keeps going to Turkey. The whole Constantly. internet seems to think he's a spy. I mm-hmm. genuinely do. Oh, well, I don't. Right. So, there, I, so, so there's, I don't pub- th- but there's I, published pieces of the fact that people think he's a spy. Yeah, not, that doesn't no, help. No, no, well, it's, it's comments. It's no, not published. It's, it's comments. comments. But still, it's but like, out there. I genuinely. Hey, I could pick it up. And I'm just a guy, but I don't think he is. And he, well, he did work for private intelligence in the U.S. for a while. Yes. yes. He was analyzing he terrorist that. beheading videos. <sighs> Open source. Yeah. That's terrible. I, yeah. I feel bad for those guys. Poor Eric. I hope you get out of there, buddy. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, social credit scores. So, <laughs> continuing on on the Eric, kind of, Eric, on, that's thirteen grand. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, your part. That's twenty six thousand. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess the question is, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but how extensive. <clears throat> that fucking smell of salt is still there. Yeah, it's, kitchen, still, it's still going. How extensive is that in China versus what we are seeing through the videos that mm. purport to show how deep it is? How real is that? It's a real thing. There's a cultural term for that. <clears throat> oh, I lost it. It's like Huijo or something like that. Your actual social credit score. It's a very real thing. <clears throat> it's like our resume or like our, our credit score. That anybody, I, you know, just, I, just, I just bought property recently they ran a credit score credit check right it's a very real thing in china you can't leave one municipality to work in another municipality you can't get accepted to college you can't get certain levels of jobs depending on this social score 
it sounds like some sort of travesty and total injustice to us, but we have the exact same thing just somewhere else, right? Yeah. We have a credit score. If you, if you, you're not going to get hired by a big company if you haven't got a four-year degree. We have the same thing here. It's just but if different. you're talking about <clears throat> like they're trying to, they're saying like, oh, we're going to move to a totally cashless society. We're already very digital, obviously. But like, you know, once you get to things like that, it's like, oh, if you don't, if you have a bad carbon footprint, they won't let you buy food at the food store. Or, you know what I mean? It could get to that type of dystopian thing. Sometimes I feel like that stuff is a bit of an over alarm yeah. bell on social practical. media. It's not right? practical. It's not practical. It's the problem with social media. Yeah. They come up with dystopian shit that's not practical. What is practical? What they do in the UAE and Saudi Arabia right now? They just auto fine you. Can you explain that? Yeah. You, you, you did a naughty thing. Your credit card is already tied to your national ID, which is already tied to your license plate. So when you speed too fast on the highway, they just auto bill you and pull money right out of your credit account and it goes right into their wow, tax account. Oh, dude. You don't have to auto sign. Bill. There's no permission. There's no nothing. It's like, it's like you just got pulled over, ticketed, and you went to court already to pay the fine, only you did it all in a half a second. They don't have an appeals court, do they? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not very good. <laughs> well, it's crazy because we're, I mean, we're already doing this to a level with like insurance. Like with car insurance, they make you put these trackers now in your glove box. Or like if you want a discount, if you want to pay yep. less for your car insurance, we'll, we'll just track you everywhere you go mm -hmm. in your car. Yeah. And people say that they're going to do this with health insurance where you want to discount on your health insurance, wear one of these eye watches yep. and we'll track your heart rate 24-7 and you'll be able to get 20% off. Right. Except yeah. we have a choice. Mm. That's the difference. Yeah. We have the choice of being like, oh, then I'll just pay full price. Mm. Right. But, uh, they're, but most there people, they don't. Most people are going to take a discount. Psst then that's okay. Yeah. Like that's that's the other thing where yeah, when you're chasing when you're chasing a budgetary life, poverty mindset, you'll cut any corner and that's a predictable human behavior. Mm -hmm. So you can't blame the government for people doing what they're going to do anyways. That's like that's how business runs. But in this the case of like is China going to start denying people the ability to buy groceries? No. They're just going to bill them automatically and increase the GDP. You said two nasty words about Xi Jinping. That's that's 150 it. Yeah. UN, boom, you have no say, Ouch. no appeal, it's gone. So that is dystopian. It's, it's completely dystopian. It's also not America, so I don't give a fuck. Yep. It's interesting, though, the tracking, tracking, you know, just in that, in your instance, right, the insur car insurance, health insurance, gathering information. Oh, yeah. Right? Who knows who the fuck is doing that? Or who they're going to sell to. Exactly. So that's, that's the scarier part. Yeah, the inconvenience of, but hey, I need to, I need to save 200 bucks on my, Oh, my car insurance this year, next year, next. Okay, you know, I'll take a chance. Mm -hmm. Roll the dice. See well, what happens. You, Jim, you did the <clears throat> the investigation into the iPhone in San Bernardino. Involved, yes. You I was involved, involved yeah, in yeah, that you, management side. But, right. But, so can you give the background on that real quick for people who aren't was the, remembering it was, that? It was San Bernardino killings, right? I mean, I don't know if we mm -hmm. could bring it up, the terrorist killings I out, on the, out on the road, yeah. whatever. So um, can you... Stephen, right? Yeah. Stephen, can you throw it out? Long story short is um, there's two things that happened there. Um, first off, they denied – they actually did not recognize a federal grand jury subpoena to provide access, not to provide records or subscriber information, to provide access to – this person's phone. The, this was Apple denied This was it? Apple denied. So <laughs> That's why I don't do business with Apple. Yep. Basically said, uh, basically put, jumped us through hoops. Instead of just saying, holy <laughs> shit, this is a terrorist act. Yep. He killed people and we need to figure out whether or not he's going to kill some more. Killed or Americans. something else is going to happen. Yeah, he killed Americans. Or is there a network that's going to continue this plot? Mm -hmm. We didn't know. And they made you go through court to end up getting in. It took a while, right? Well, we went through court. We went. We did go through court. It took longer than it should have. In the meantime, we have people that could have hacked it in mm -hmm. thirty seconds, including um, what is it? Self. Uh, the, uh, the company is. It could do it in two seconds. Mm -hmm. So, but who, which company is going to fight Apple on knocking into their system? The reason I bring it up, Cellbrite. I think it's Cellbrite. Is the, company. the reason I bring it up is because it's such a horrible thing, and it's a clear cut terrorist. Clearly, someone who was radicalized he had already done the act we n everyone knew the shit you'd be able to find stuff on his phone i want to say there was shit uh, i mean there was some vi was there some video I, uh, something i don't remember I don't but know. either way i bring it up because i actually somewhat <clears throat> understand why 
Tim Cook did that and can appreciate it as much as it annoys me because he's looking at it because it was a public story. This was something known to the public. Not that it should be different if it's not, but you have the the public arguing over whether or not the government should be allowed to check a phone and it's a constitutional rights potential precedent if they do. So Tim Cook said, shit, I want to help with this, but if I do... I set the precedent that Apple gives up user data. Can you understand why he sent that through court and why that's a good thing in this country as opposed to yeah, no, I, I, totally, countries? I totally get that. But is we like we talked about a little bit earlier, um, would you cross the line if safety was in question? Would you do that? That's the poison pill, and it's tough. I get it. You know, it's but tough. Did did Tim Cook think about this in the perspective that you shared i don't know i don't know i don't know i think he did i don't know was the owner was the owner of the iphone a u.s citizen i think he was yeah can you zoom in a little bit steven so we can read it he was so yeah that's i think there was the very top like he felt bad about if he didn't then he put it then (laughs) whatever then he he put on a good a good yeah he definitely he definitely put on a a great to save the uh save the day you know, go back where it yeah, shows his name. Go down. Death, scroll down. Break and see, that's, that was it. It'll, it talks about the guy who owned it. You'll see his name in, in like bold bold words. Keep going. Pa- there it is. The there he is. Theory. Enrique yep. Martinez. Yep. Uh, well, no, that's... No, that's the... Yeah, that's... He yep. was for... Was he... Was he, his name Farouk? Yeah, it's up It's up a little bit. Oh, he it's was... He top. converted to Islam. Yeah, Farouk. We can do a control search. There's the possibility of the third shooter. So, what? See oh, right oh, here. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah. The, uh, that's oh, the part. Oh, that's the part. F A R O O K. O O K. There he is. Yep. Farouk and Malik. Farouk's mother. Yep. Let's so, so let's scroll up. The Riz Rizwan Farouk. Riz, oh, scroll down a touch, just a touch. Right, Rizwan Farouk and Tashfeen Malik. Mm-hmm. So I don't remember which one it was the phone. You can for. click on the name perpetrator on the right hand side of the screen. Click on the name. Yep. It was that. It was that guy. Whoever yep. that. Yeah. So that's Farouk. Yep. So it was his phone. Pakistan American mass shooter. So Pakistani American. That's uh, was a U.S. citizen, right? Was born yep. in Chicago and was a U.S. citizen. His parents immigrated. All right. So this is for me, and to this day, I do not support Apple because of this event. This is bullshit. This Total bullshit. This is an American company choosing to protect its own marketing message publicly only because it was public. If this had happened outside of the public eye, they'd have shared, they'd have helped. They don't protect user data. Yeah, Apple doesn't do. protect I mean, user exactly. data. That's a exactly. marketing message. Yes. All they did here was they they interrupted an investigation. They slowed down the, the wheels of justice. Big they exposed Amer- more Americans to the risk of a continued operation. And they sent a clear message to other terrorists around the world. Use Apple Live. Use Apple phones. Mm-hmm. We'll take care of you. That's exactly right. Man. Fucking That's bullshit, man. We won't man. give you up. That we'll never give you up. We, we've got your back. I don't care if he felt bad. I can almost guarantee you that was either that was a, a director of like marketing or a board or something that was like, oh guys, I don't know how we're going to be able to do this. Our share price is going to stack. We just got done promising all these people that Could we're going to protect yeah. user data. Yep. That's Could baloney, be. and that's why I will. I just do not have good things. I have nothing nice to say about Apple. I do not spend my money on Apple. I will not spend my money on Apple until Apple changes this kind of yep. shit. What kind of phone do you use? Android. The green text. That's why our group texts are all and green And they wouldn't text. do the same thing? Would they block the wheels of justice? Yeah. Wait, when they do, I'll go to fucking Nokia. I'll go to Huawei. That's <laughs> 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 <I'm> escalated quickly. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I just don't, like, I fully understand your anger. Maybe, I don't know that this is a good parallel, but like, I completely agree with you that behind the scenes they're passing shit like this all the time, oh but the God. public doesn't know about it, so they're like, okay. But when the public does know about it, now it's something that is, prece- I'm going to make up a word here, but precedentable in court. So, would you rather, I don't I don't know this is a good parallel, but would you rather see the kill, serial killer kill eight people or ten if you had the choice? Well, obviously. Right, and it's a yeah. bad one for this because we are talking about a literal serial killer that right, they're protecting right, right. on the sentence. So I, I recognize that. But like the precedent publicly, I get where they're doing that because at least this is admissible in court. The other ones we're never going to find out about and they just trample. I mean, you've seen it with what Snowden exposed. They just do it behind the scenes 
you know, and they it it might be illegal, but they find a legalese way with you know the what powers your, of branches against it. What is your right to privacy? Well, how does in the eyes of the law, what is an individual's right to privacy when they are being investigated right. for once a crime? they once they or actively in the process of committing a terrorist act? But what is the like, what's the answer? Like if if I'm arrested right now on suspicion of drug charges, yep. mm-hmm. what? privacy rights do i have that the investigation cannot penetrate i don't as, think as part of this investigation i don't think anything there's think none you right could, you could do yeah i mean some things you're gonna have to get a subpoena but that's turn around because in seconds. any place you there's don't have evidence. apple fighting you back any it, place there's evidence yep. uh, it's the law should be able to reach into those places where there's evidence. absolutely yeah so free the, reign i feel i feel like the this is your your unprecedented unprecedentable or whatever it is right your made up word yeah yeah the the precedent the whole argument about precedence is wrong here because if if an American citizen breaks an American law, if anybody breaks an American law, then it is the right of that person to be proven guilty or innocent in a court of their peers, which means any and all evidence that's available should be brought to bear. Not if it breaks techni- I'm just saying technically not if it breaks constitutional code to do it as an that's example. That's what we just said. There's no privacy law that applies to the person who's being investigated. That's right. It's evidence. Your privacy I mean, can't block access is that to true? evidence. We're, if we're actively if we're actively listening to your phone, we've got a different standard. Because you're not Title you're not breaking the law right now. Right. But and that's a whole other process. But if oh, we, if I you go out saying. if you and you two go outside and start shooting people and I can get to your phone to make sure that you're not going to shoot the next or who you're how you're talking, where you're I going next. It. Right, that's very different. We need to get that. So you're yep. saying if you have already provably beyond a reasonable doubt with full evidence committed the crime, you nope. now no longer nope, have those nope, rights. Nope, 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 nope. As soon as you are under suspicion of a criminal act. Well, see, you now hold no- on a second. That's not right. Technically, we live okay. in a world where if you catch a serial killer and the cop breaks the law to do it with 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 something that is not so, probable cause, they have so, to be let go. So search and seizure. What's one exception to search and seizure? I don't know. What is it? emergent circumstances so we without that ability to do that you're not violating the fourth amendment certain seizure amendment but you're saying this is a problem we, we could have further death and destruction it is an emerging problem that we were not mm-hmm. previously aware of until this moment that's I got you. bottom line even with regards to uh an utterance during somebody's dying and they say, I fucking killed that person, yeah. right? You can now use that piece or Danny killed that person. And that's a good thing, man. That's a good thing because if if Dick Von Dyke walks in and he's like, I, you beat my child in the backyard yesterday. And you were like, I did not beat your child. And he comes in with a police officer. Police officer's like, we got to investigate you to, to prove your guilt or your innocence. As soon as you say, okay, that's cool, but you can't look at my phone. It, there could be evidence on the phone that protects you from the charges being presented to you. Mm. So a truly innocent person of a crime is like, have anything you want. The only look. people who have something to hide are the people who are guilty. Real quick to all my Discord people out there, the Julian Dory Discord is officially live. I put the link down in the description below. So go hit that, join the community, and say what's up. There's all kinds of features in there, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Let's get it popping. Now, second question, because this is what Americans are really afraid of. They're really afraid if somebody comes in and accuses you of stealing from them, you say, I didn't steal from you, here's my phone, and then on and reviewing the phone, the police officer sees that you might be embezzling money from your business, from your mm. from your job. So in that case, or pictures of child porn on there, right? So in now, that case, you, what happens? Yeah, I mean, in, in that circumstance, it's it's we we seize, we stop, we seize, we get the court order, we write it up the way it's supposed to be written up. We look and we go forward with the same predication with regards to the rights of that person so now we've got to read the miranda rights maybe it's not about the embezzlement or the theft maybe it is about you have you're actively you know uh, taking child porn pictures and sending them around we'll make you aware of it but it doesn't mean that you're off the hook because now if we grab that phone start just searching through it start charging on it probably not it's it's going to be a problem but it's probably not going to happen overnight it's going to so now the charges that's what that's what american people are really afraid of what they're afraid of 
is that if their privacy is looked into, something. Right, something's going to come up. They're breaking some rule and they're going to get caught. Right. Right? People don't realize that, like, if if he's hunting down a case and it's a child porn case and he he wants to close the case you know he wants to win that case that's the objective so if he finds your phone and he searches your phone and there's no kitty porn on your phone but there's a text message that says you're cheating on your wife he's like i don't really care about that like that that does not get me promoted yep. Cra- like taking down a child porn ring does and you're not part of that ring. Here's your phone back. Yep. Have fun cheating on your wife. Have fun embezzling your boss. I'm going to go find my child porn ring and, yep. sh- and tear it down. That's right. No mora- no morality police on that piece. But if I find that they're planning to rob a bank tomorrow, That's it doesn't mean I just take it and start. I could start acting on it, but I'm going to take it and say, sir, you know, we're going to hold this here. Read the Miranda on that portion of it. Go through the process, which is an immediate process. That was the, that was the mm-hmm. shit ass part of what Apple did is not just going i mean you could see i mean they went through iterations of court visits and subpoena and court order issues and they still were like Meh. and in the meantime we could have cracked that phone was cracked in two seconds yeah. i think acceptable. we might have cracked it you know i mean we might have been in but just waiting what were those conversations like you guys like hop on a conference call with tim cook or like because you guys were obviously very frustrated general, i mean general counsel gets involved and just distracts and diverts and deflects because that person's listening to the boss. He's listening to the guy who is the guy. Right. So it's lawyers talking, basically. Lawyers talking, right? basically. But in the meantime, you got he's got a board to to deal with, right? So again, just what we're talking about. That board is putting pressure on that CEO. So the decisions he made, which I'm sure he regrets at this point, yeah. they're on his back. And the board just says, what an idiot you are, or a great job. And they are using it, to be clear. Like, they are using it to sell, like, their yay privacy thing. Absolutely. Years later, and I'm not naive. This, yeah. It's ridiculous. They, they're they're the dwarf among midgets with that. Like they may be a little better than some of the other guys, yep. but like they're still yeah they're still yep. breaking it left and yep. right. It's it there's Fourth Amendment is a complicated piece, but in that particular instance, it's not. You know, it, we we've got a circumstance where people can either a serious bodily injury or death is the consequence of not being able to obtain that information. So he would rather have fought that you know, exigent circumstance argument and have a little day in court the next day, then just say, you know what? I see what you're saying. Let's go. General counsel there. Let's go. Let's do it. And here's the reason why. You explain that to the American people, you know, 80% of them are going to go, get it. Totally get it. 20% yeah. are going to be like, let's fuck with this guy. You know? Is the Patriot Act still alive and well? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I'm sure it's changed. Yeah, but, definitely. And again, I'm a fan, right? Because here's the thing. We create lots of noise. Bad guys love to hide in the noise. If you don't, if you don't suck up the noise, and then try to find the signals that are buried inside it, then bad shit happens. Mm. You can't just ignore the fact that bad people are hiding in good places. You can't just ignore it. You have to go into it and you have to collect. It's the thing we never hear about anyone getting getting caught under the Patriot Act. I don't think you, you will. don't hear about it. I don't exactly. Think you will. Yeah, I don't think you will. Um, that court's not public. <laughs> I mean, bottom line is if, if you're a terrorist or you're not, you shouldn't be offended either way. If you're a bear, be a grizzly yeah, on right. both sides. Period. You got to keep in mind that whenever, whenever you have a success in law enforcement or a success in intel, when you publicize that success, you're sending a message about your methods and your sources uh. to the other criminals who are out there doing it. Yeah. So if you got five terrorist cells operating in five different cities... And then you arrest one of them in San Antonio. And then you publicize the case in San Antonio. The other four cells are like, oh shit, he probably got caught because he made the wrong phone call or he did this with his housing records or whatever else. So then they clean that part up of their operation and you run the risk of not being able to shut down the other four. It's better to not, what's, what's the point? When you're a true public servant, you don't do it for the praise. You don't do it for recognition from the American public. You do it because you're keeping your country safe you don't need such anybody's a, approval such a good point it's amazing all the things that changed permanently in this country because of islamic terrorism and yeah. it's one thing you don't hear about anymore nobody in the media mm-hmm. nobody in politics talks about islamic ter- terrorism anymore yet we still have the patriot act we still have airport security you still have islamic TS- terror tsa you still have yeah, extremist yeah, 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 yeah. terrorism yeah. I'm, we're saying they don't talk about it oh, as no. much anymore 
Yeah, we've, it's because of the emergency powers, right? They, they take their powers from emergencies and those powers never go away. You know what it is? It's, it's, to borrow a phrase from my friend, from my friend Redi, Remy Adeleke, he, co- he said something like, there's the pill in the cake. And so I'm trying to look at this from both perspectives now because I, I see where you guys are coming from and I'm not saying I agree. I'm also, I'm really like, punting this one i'm not saying i disagree this is a really tough one for me i'm looking at the other side the people listening right now who may be arguing like my rights my privacy and i hear that as well and i say when you talk about things and use words like to protect us your safety to live that's the cake and then the pill you put in the cake so that the kid eats the fucking pill is you say this is what we got to do to do it but no worries i don't care about you know, whether you're cheating on your wife or not when I find it. And you know what? As And I've said this to you on a podcast before directly, Jim. I believe you. I don't think either of you care about that. I think you I, I think you guys are good guys. You guys are my friends off, off camera and I value that a lot. But like, I also know these are big organizations. And when you give these powers, you give them to everyone when you set that precedent. So all it takes is that one guy who's a total fucking jerk off to take advantage of this stuff. And I'm not saying he'd care about like whether some asshole is cheating on his wife. I'm think we could think of better examples than that. But then you have things that veer into, all right, we are just openly accepting that the constitution is being trampled on. I think that's a little bit of an extreme take, accepting that the constitution is being trampled on. Trampled's a strong word, but the constitution is at least being violated. In, that's a better word. In what way? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm losing it. Yeah, the 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 ability when you give the government the ability to say, "Let me get a twofer for this," if I were to come across it, which the Constitution is supposed to say, well, you don't. Well, the I mean, Constitution does not say that you're allowed to do a crime as long as you're not caught. No, it's but it does say you have the right to privacy, and I'm going to mess up some words, so let's not go too deep. And that if there is if there are crimes that are discovered as a result of a violation of these rights that is anti-constitutional. So, so it does say look, that. Let's look at it this way. If, if law enforcement took my phone with no subpoena or nothing else and started just scrolling through it and taking notes, all right, uh, he did steal two grand here, did steal, and then, okay, thank you so much, sir, and then, and then went out and fucking charged it, that's that's a different story. Violation of privacy. Absolutely. But, okay. but if I come in and I, I know that you use your phone in order to run – you know, a heroin ring, sales ring, right? And I say, here it is, and here's the proof because we've got six sources that have bought from you, yeah. including an undercover cop. Here it is, right? And okay, no worries. That that subpoena will be scoped out to that piece. Mm-hmm. However, yeah. if during that course I'm looking through and I'm like, holy shit, this guy's going to kill his mother tomorrow, right? I am. You're not. At, at you're not. Point, you have no constitutional protection. Yeah, I'm going to go and go back to the judge and say we. Your Honor, we have to increase the scope here because this is what I found. Then it gives me the opportunity yeah. to, to look at that, gain my independent corroboration based on that, right? Build another investigation. Sure, he's a drug dealer. He's not predicated to have committed mm-hmm. murder. But now there's a statement in there knowing that I have the obligation to do that. No violation of Fourth Amendment because I went through the process. But I stop everything at that point. I don't I don't say, you motherfucker, I'm going to interrogate yep, you. I'm okay. killing your mother tomorrow. That's people right? don't understand the due process. That's, it's it's very strict. It's very stringent. You the, know, it truly is. The thing that protects you is not the Constitution. The thing that protects you is the due process. The Absolutely. fact that when, when he sees evidence on your phone that makes him think you're going to kill your mother or your mother-in-law... He then begins a new process to corroborate independently and confirm whether that is true or not and that you get put in front of a panel of your peers for a judgment for that. And, and, and you planning to kill your mother isn't even a crime. It's just, it's the, it's the possible premeditated uh, effort of, right? So it has to be investigated, it has to be pursued, it has to be. Because if we don't, we're actually violating the constitutional rights of the mother-in-law who's Absolutely. trusting us to protect her. And I'm Mirandizing you. So the first thing I'm saying is, look, don't, I, I'm, I'm me personally and probably most that we know, don't say anything. Don't, don't talk. You know, I want you to have this right mm-hmm. under the Sixth Amendment for counsel, right? So I'm going to Mirandize you towards that. You've already, I've already shown you all I need to know on this portion. Of gaining the, the information. heroin ring, we're good, yeah. That's and I'm and I'm going to arrest process. you for that. But I'm going to Mirandize you when I put the cuffs on. This one here is different. This one here is different. Listen, shut your mouth, call your lawyer, 
And then we're going to run through the pro- – we're going to secure the – you know, all the things we would go through naturally processed. But should I just start pursuing that that potential murder for hire or what – we're losing that. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna need it's going to, away. I'm going to need to listen to this back afterwards to make sure I have it all straight. Yeah. You may have convinced me on the San Bernardino one. You might have, because we know he did what he did. Correct. You might have convinced me on that. What about applying it, though, to something like not what Snowden did, leaking out, that's a separate conversation, but the thing he leaked, which is Stellar Wind, was just said using some provisions of the Patriot Act and then also some of the stuff we talked about earlier, like when Comey went in the hospital with Ashcroft and they were using like underground stuff. That provisioned the government to look through any cell records of anybody. That is good. Because where are the bad guys hiding? Among the good people. You're not, gonna find, you're not going to find. You're not going to find the the bad guy doing bad things unless you look at all the data, right? That's the thing. And the Snowden invest, the, all the Snowden stuff, that was contentious even in NSA. That was contentious even in secret courts. They couldn't figure it out. And let's not forget yeah. where we were in time. We were still reeling from the deaths of nine eleven. Mm. It was contentious. Nobody, it wasn't clear cut. Nobody knew for sure what was going on. It was untapped. It was un, un, uh, unknown force for everybody, right? We were all f- figuring our new. way out. Yeah. It was new. Right? So like, did Snowden do the right thing, the wrong thing? I'm kind of tired of even people asking that question because you're taking it out of context. I'm not. You're not. You're not. I'm Most not people out there, every fucking person out there who thinks that Snowden did the right thing is completely blind to the context of the time. At the context of the time, America was terrified that thousands more people would be killed in a mass attack that could have been prevented. 2,997 people died in on American soil in less than 24 hours. Yep. Think about that number, dude. Do you know how many people died in all of the global war on terrorism? I think 7,000. Yeah. yeah. So- just a little bit more than a half. One, more than a third yep. of all the wow. deaths in all 22 years of the global war on terrorism happened in 24 hours in New York. Yeah. Right? That's and fucking th- crazy. And things have changed. If you, if, you were, if you were present during that time, immediately after 9-11 for years after, years. You, you had terrified American average Joes calling our offices to tell us that in mm-hmm. fact their neighbor there's a man that lives next door i how long have you known him 15 years but i know he's planning the yep. next attack fear I'm positive mm-hmm. does that, or a gas station guy does that make it you right know? to violate people's privacy absolutely no, not that doesn't make it right but you have to understand that in order for us to evolve to the next layer of security we had to get into some dirty stuff and figure out like how do we do this lawfully that's not something that you figure out in 10 minutes. No. That's something that takes time, multiple attorneys, multiple specialists, multiple experts saying, are we doing the right thing? Maybe we should pull it back here. Maybe we should push it forward here. That's why there's a break between confidential information, classified information, sensitive information, and public record. Not because it's going to stay that way permanently, but because until we figure our shit out, the last thing we need is the American people to also weigh in their two cents exactly. on what's going on right now. Because you know what the average American citizen isn't burdened with? Protecting the lives of other, other American citizens. That's our burden to carry. And we take that burden very seriously. So you don't have to worry about keeping your neighbor safe. You only have to worry about keeping your family safe. You don't have to worry about keeping fucking anybody safe. We used to go to bed thinking about how to keep strangers that we will never meet safe all the time. And Continuously. That's, that's why we become so unflinchingly patriotic because if I had to worry about keeping every global citizen safe, I'd be fucking stressed out. At least I can cut that back and be like, all I care about is American citizens. I want to keep Americans safe. Jim, you were, you were there that day when the towers came down. You were on the ground right there. Yeah. Yikes. Where were you? So uh, meeting with New Jersey State Police Maritime Unit uh, early morning, young trooper sees what he thought was what we all thought Cessna flew into the, you know, accident, heart attack, whatever he flies in. He just said to us, you mind if we take the meeting on the water? Uh, only because my dad works in that building. So of course, you know, yeah, let's do that. So we start going over and shit, everything broke out, you know, 
broke loose. So second plane comes over the top, smashes. We realize we're in, we're, we're going to war at that point. Mm. You know, that's, I think, what I said. We're going to war, and people are dying, and then pulling up to the Staten Island Ferry Terminal and working through that and getting downtown and being in Burger King's basement when the towers came down. So I was in fifth floor, you know, five floors like down. Like Church Street? Yeah, and I just said, yeah, Church I just said, ah, that's it. I'm fucking dead. Yeah. I, I really did. And then trying just to get out, just just to get out and not be able to see and not be able to feel, and then knowing that thousands of people were dead. I figured we figured thirty five. You know, we were like twenty five, thirty five thousand people because it was early. It was early enough, but Wall Streeters are in. They're in. They're working. They're going so they can come back home at a reasonable time. Beautiful day, the whole deal. So um, absolutely a feeling of, the, I, I you know obviously. Pearl Harbor and those other things we weren't around for, but that's what it felt like. Mm. And, um, you know, it just became, hey, there were there were people that just jumped in and helped, and there were people that just ran from it. You but know? you were also going to work right away. Yeah, I mean, I was in, I don't think I got out of New York for four days. Right. So, you know, so, trying to pile up and, and figure out what was going on. And did they have, like, they, they had, like, those... Uh, Temporary offices like set up in garages and stuff, right? Well, well, the interesting part was that the meeting that day was to set up a, an emergency um, kind of command post at the Battery Park Station Coast Guard hmm. Station. Wow. So that oh was what the meeting God. was about, and and then it just breaks out, right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it was it was intensely crazy across the board. You've told the story though about September fifteenth, two thousand one. Yeah on on my podcast before and how you arrested the egyptians i forget what they what was their role again so they were a what we consider a supply you know a supply cell basically to to americanize those that were coming over through clothing through passports through jobs through pay stubs through tax returns that was their position I, you know so again, quiet new jersey Beach Very. Town. I mean, Seaside Heights. I'll say it now. Seaside okay. Heights, you know, great little seasonal town, small apartment, you know, 10 of them living in there, working on the boardwalk for two and a half years, working at the grocery store, the Acme yeah. uh, that separates Seaside Heights from Seaside Park around that turn there. So we just get a call you know, on, on Wednesday, right. call on Wednesday, 12th. Hey, uh, these guys have never missed a paycheck in like six years. Some of them, they're, they're not here. They're not coming in. I, I don't know if it's you know, makes a difference, but they're Middle Easterners and we want to, so we get the information, go down. And I told you, I mean, the hair on the back of my neck, first time in a long time, you know, I haven't had that since overseas time with the hair on the back of my neck goes up and I'm like, holy shit. And you they know, were, and they, oh, they were the deal. Yeah. They were looking, I mean, they were doing whatever. We found $450,000 in cash in backpacks wow. and every piece of Eddie Bauer clothing you've ever seen in every size. And no one ever heard about this one. And, and the reason and two new cars. The reason I the reason I bring this up is to actually kind of make your guys' point for you. Mm -hmm. I'll bet in those three and a half days after the towers come down, when investigations like this start. So you said it was the day after we got the call. Yep. There was never a conversation in that office that said, "Can we talk about these guys' constitutional rights real fast before conducting a raid to save lives?" You know, it's interesting. So I'll tell you this, right? So detainment is what we need to do at the time, and we didn't look at a damn thing. We did call back the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we got a really good dude who, um, you know, just questioned us on the whole thing. I want to see pictures, see what's mm. going on. I want to know what's happening. Interesting. Wrote up that search warrant quickly. I'm not saying it was one <laughs> where we were, hey, over time, you know, like normally it's over time, you know, you're arguing for a week to get a search warrant. Well, I don't really like it. It was really red brick. It wasn't white brick on the front. And they'll do that to you, slow you down a little bit. This one was like, hey, go. And once we started to go, and we knew, you, you line things up in your mind's eye. You got people sitting in different spots. You're seeing what they're doing, trying to talk to each other. We're trying to separate. It was intense. It was an intense time. We found weapons. And as, as know, an American so, citizen, fog of war, moment after that happens. But we did the right I'm thing. I'm okay then. with, yeah. We did the right thing. Yeah, tomorrow. Got no Dude, problem. That happens yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. You, you, why would we intentionally you know? slow down a, uh, a search warrant? We, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the the deal is, if he would have showed up at the apartment and everything would have been kosher, mm -hmm. no no backpacks pre-planned to Americanize people traveling in and out, no cash reserves, no weapons. If it would have just been 10 hardworking Egyptian immigrants or 10 uh, American documented I Egyptians legally, no no case, no arrests, no problem, Right. It no does, you don't dispatch law enforcement yeah. slowly to protect people's privacy. 
No, you got to get them out there. Let them do their job. They're there to enforce the law. No law is broken. Nothing to enforce. Thank you very much for exactly right. letting us inconvenience you. Exactly right. You know, I think about this this case. So, fifth, 2015. So, you know, 14 years after Bernardino. What mm-hmm. What would that? What would he have done? What would Cook have done? September was, 15th. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He what get, would he have done? Oh, he get. There's no question. He gives it. So, so we forget. We don't forget, but people forget. Right, because they're not in it. Like just like a Vietnam vet will not forget that he wasn't welcomed home. Yeah, when he came home. Yeah. Now the rest of us are like, eh, all right, I'll say, hey, uh, you know, how many times are you corrected? Thank you for your service. Nope, welcome home. That's what you say to a Vietnam. Okay, sorry about that. Right. So I've learned that, but it's the same kind of sense of being in the middle of it, and we never have, we never have the time has not suppressed our sense of urgency, mm-hmm. but for a lot of people, it has. You know, and I often worry, um, now that I'm out of the mix, mm. we're both out of the mix, I often worry that is there enough people with eye on the ball? Or is it just nothing's, nobody's tried anything, therefore we're just like, okay, we're doing the best we can. Here's The, the truth is that we left when all the cadre that were our peers and the cadre that had kind of greeted us to come in all knew that sense of urgency, all knew the taste of, of imminence. So when we left federal government, we took that with us, that sense of imminence. Absolutely. Right? That impulse, that need to get it done and get it done right and get it done now. And now we apply it to the business sector. And the customers that we serve love it because they're so accustomed to working with employees and colleagues and attorneys and everybody who's like, no problem right now. We'll, we'll wait another day. We'll wait another week. We'll wait a couple more hours. It doesn't have to be done right now, right? We come in and we're like, you don't know what comes tomorrow. You don't know what comes in an hour. You don't know you're going to be breathing in 15 minutes. Mm. The urgency is always there. That doesn't mean that we're going to, you know, we're anxious and we're flipping ourselves out and we're not able to sleep at night. It means that the superpower, the thing that differentiates you against your competition doesn't have to be fancy technology doesn't have to be 12 degrees. It can literally just be that you take other people's problems seriously, perhaps even more seriously than they take their own fucking problem. And then Mm -hmm. you get it fixed, you give them a solution, you get them through it, and you're done. For businesses, that literally translates into profit. Getting a business's problem solved quickly literally turns into money. We deal with ultra high net worth people who have like not seen family been been separated from family or had legal issues or whatever else they haven't seen their their daughter in 15 years seven years or they suspect that their ex-wife ran away with their old partner who knows what we deal with people that have these incredible life issues and they've gone to other companies and they've been like hey can you connect me with my daughter and the companies are like hmm sure we'll we'll need about 90 days to do that (laughs) and then 90 days later they're like it's been a little bit more of a challenge than we thought it was we roll in there we're like you haven't talked to your daughter I want you talking to her now. Yeah. So we work our asses off and close that gap in days. And then people look at us like we're mutants of some kind of, and I was like, <laughs> no, dude, if it was my daughter, I'd want it tomorrow. That's yeah. Right. doesn't make it any different to me that it's your daughter, right? We, that's, that's the way we just took that out of some of the darkest years in US history. And now we apply it in the business world and it works. We're not super smart guys, right? We're just committed to doing the best that we can for every American we meet. Amen to that, man. Did you see any changes? Because you came into CIA in 2007. Is that right? Did you see like hardcore, or not even hardcore, did you see clear changes when like the administration turned over from Bush to Obama or was it? Yes. Really? Yeah. Clear changes during that change. I think they're, the big changes for us I saw, 2007, 2008, 2009, they, the, the changes happened slowly, right? So that first few years I was in, there was a certain pace, a tempo, right? And then 2010, 2011, 2012, that tempo changed. And then by the time I left, it was changing again, right? And I wasn't even there at 16 when all the Trump stuff started taking place. So there's absolutely a a change, a flow in the direction of culture, prioritization, clearances, Mm -hmm. you know, what you're willing to spend money on, what you're not willing to spend money on. uh, And this stuff, it's just a change. So with, with the Obama years, we were very much focused on on um, the Asia pivot, 
and transitioning so that our operations were less focused on counterterrorism and more focused on emerging threats because East Asia was an emerging threat mm. in 2010, 11, 12. Right now it's a clear and present threat. So if that doesn't give you some comfort that CIA is doing their fucking job, hmm. 2022, it was a threat. 2010, we started shifting to meet that threat. You see what I'm saying? That's good. Mm. That's, that's, that's the way professionals do yeah. it, man. But when you're, yeah, when you're a fucking armchair analyst, you don't pull your head out of your ass until it's already an imminent threat. And then you're like, oh, no one's doing their job. Mm. No, nah, dude, people were doing their job for decades before you pulled your head out of your ass. What about for you when you have a situation where, unlike in the CIA, when a new administration comes in, obviously Tenet was an exception, but like usually the, the, the director of the CIA changes and stuff, but yours doesn't necessarily do that. I don't yeah. think it did. No, it didn't. I mean, we had, we had two different, you know, Louis Free, the best director, you know, I worked for. Um, Bob Mueller changed the bureau. So he wanted to become administratively perfect. What that does that was mean? his goal. So in other words, um, and, and we're seeing, honestly, I got to say at this point, we're seeing some of the benefit of that with the actual documentation of source meetings, the documentation of investigations that was kind of loosey-goosey my first couple years. Hmm. So Mueller changed that over, but we also took our eye off the ball with many of the crime problems, many of the threats. Like what? We kind of lost. Eh, you mean organized crime. You know, it just became kind of the summer of the shark thing. Like, ah, there's no more organized crime. Don't summer of the it. shark. Yeah. You know what I mean? So DARPA sharks. Yeah, DARPA um, sharks. <laughs> but it, it, it became less important. And what became more important was tightening the noose on the cases we already knew we had tight already. And I couldn't believe that. You know, there was questions asked. I think we're the FBA now, the Federal mm. Bureau of Administration. Mm. We're no longer investigating. We're just making sure of what we do. And that led to changes in our administrative policy, um, when you could open a case, how long you had in order to do, uh, you know, like an assessment versus an investigation, what that meant, what the tools that you were allowed to use during the assessment phase versus the investigative stage, it became to a lot of hard chargers that were new, it became, oh, I thought we were the knights in shining armor. Hmm. We're just, we have to prove, we have to prove a case before we get a search warrant. That's what it became. So you had that period of time Terrorism was always rock steady. You know, after 9-11, terrorism was rock steady. I mean, we're, we learned our lesson. And like I, I've said before, many of the counterterrorism agents pre-9-11 were the broken toys. We mm, talk about yep. that. So, oh, you know, whatever. And, and I told funny stories, but they're true. You know, we called at 2 p.m. say, hey, where are you? <laughs> oh, shit, I was cutting my lawn. I mean, this is on 9-11. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, but if you take it forward, I think, I think what Ray has done is has – just buried his head in the sand. Mm. I'm not going to answer questions. I'm not going to move the management and leadership forward. Good luck finding out. I'll be gone in a couple of years. So take care of Maybe, hopefully it'll be gone sooner than that. But. Public servants are in a rough place right now because American citizens have so much information about what is being done at all these different levels of government. Mm. And I say information because they don't have facts. They have some facts and lots and lots of garbage, speculation, accusation, theories. So everybody, everybody feels this need to form an opinion. I remember, and I'm not saying it was better back in the past than it is right now, but we do need to find a way to evolve past this garbage phase that we're in right now. But I remember when my parents were still parenting me, they had a certain level of like, they're doing what they have to do to keep us safe. But they weren't. My dad wasn't up late reading tabloids about FBI. My mom wasn't like, you know, watching every documentary there was about all of CIA's illegal operations in Colombia. They had better shit to do, right? And they didn't bother with trying to police IRS, NSA, NRO. They didn't care. They were like, they're doing what they have to do. My job is to do what I have to do. And right now I have to raise you. Now we live in a world where people can basically be taking a dump and scrolling through TikTok and now they're all upset about what's going on with Chinese exploding helmets. <laughs> right? So true though, man. Yeah. So they 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 feel the need to be involved in shit that they know nothing about and they don't even understand that they don't know nothing about it because they believe the sources of information that they get because they don't know how to vet sources. 
because they're not professional intelligence officers. They're not professional national security officers. What was that? What was that analogy you're making with the summer of the shark? What, where did that come from? So, so you know, the sharks were pre 9 11, right? So now we've had another summer. I think we had another summer of the shark this past summer. Darp right? sharks, yeah, yeah, yeah darp sharks, right? Mm -hmm. So Ukrainian shark uh, attacks sharks. all over the place. Summer 2001. Why? Because they're getting reported. People were saying, "Holy shit! Don't go near that beach." They show video and everything mm -hmm. else. Now it's drone shots, and all of a sudden 9 11 happens, and it was almost like. Stop getting reported. That's the only reason. It, it, it kept happening. They sharks, stopped biting. Sharks didn't say like, fuck, these people are going through a lot. <laughs> We're going to give them some space. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, I mean, it just just <laughs> didn't happen. And uh, and kind of the same thing with organized crime. Yeah. You know, it, it's not that mobsters weren't being mobsters. I mean, there's a, a little bit of a difference with the code and bullshit right. that that is. The respect, the yeah, okay, you know, whatever. But it's not that they weren't doing the exact same things just that we didn't have yeah. interest or time or we put the worst of the worst on those squads it's called reporting bias yeah, yeah. it's another one yeah. of the reasons that you see so much reporting around military bases of ufos does that actually mean ufos are more interested in military bases or that the people and the tools at military bases are, are more observant mm. than the people and the tools in no name kentucky mm. right so the reporting bias is the same thing. It's an, it's another example of the opportunity cost we we're talking about with Ukraine. You spend seventy five billion to do one thing, which means you're not spending seventy five billion to do this other mm, thing. Right. You're dedicating all your officers to counterterrorism. That means you're not dedicating those officers to organized crime. What is your opinion on the government agencies controlling the media narrative of like the top media outlets? Like kind of like we talked about last night. I know you know I know it's 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 hard sometimes hanging out with you guys. Because you spend so much time worrying about government agencies controlling the narrative, government agencies controlling the, the, the tools and people being plants and people being whatever. <laughs> if you had any idea how limited budgets were at the federal government and how insignificant the public's opinion is to those government agencies, then you would get a sense of why they wouldn't spend any time trying to plant a YouTube plant that gets lots of views and controls a narrative on a channel that's controlled by Google. It, it doesn't matter. So the, is the, are secret government agencies in charge? Or do they care about the media spin? No. They don't need to care about the media spin. What do you mean no? They don't care. Well, there's, there's, there's no impact on national security. There's the cost would be outrageous. Some stories there's probably impact on national security. Absolutely, like Jack, Mur like Jack Murphy's story. I disagree on that. You can yeah. disagree all you want. You weren't on the inside. It doesn't matter to us to stand in the way of the American population's access to information. The blowback is so significant if you get caught, and the cost is so outrageous. You'd never be able to justify the results. You've heard yep. him say it already today, right? It's so much easier to just selectively release information and let the media do the predictable thing and run it to ground. That's way more effective. Like the like sure. the UAP, yeah. The, yeah. That's, yeah, sure, okay. So that's Keep the going. way that we do it. It's like, oh, we've got 15 secrets. Well, we'll what are we gonna do about these 15 secrets? Well, two of these aren't really that secret, and if we let them loose, like we'd send a message to the Chinese. Remember the four things I was telling you about? You gotta think about yep. what's the impact now, what's the impact to your adversary, how are you gonna walk it back? That's the way we think. It's mm -hmm. so much easier to control that when you just choose to let something out rather than when you try to shape a limited and hangout. control yeah. a narrative. Mm -hmm. That's what well, it is. What yeah. about Jack Murphy's story that I told you about yesterday? I've told this story ad nauseum on the podcast, but he's the ex-Army Ranger guy who did that reporting on the... Um, this, the NATO allies that were running covert operations, sabotage operations in Russia. He got a bunch of former uh, CIA people to be his sources on the story. And there was like probably 12 of them, I think, that confirmed the story and all corroborated the story. And then he spent a year writing it and was going to publish it in one of the top two um, New York news, Times newspaper publications. I don't know if it was the New York Times or not. He never confirmed which one it was. Oh, he didn't? Um, but it was one of the top two ones. And uh, they were ready to, pub to publish the whole entire story, press the publish button, but the editor at that publication said, we have to make one more call to the deputy director of the CIA to confirm it and get his take on it. He got a three-way call to the deputy director, dep deputy director who has a an off-the-record agreement with that publication said, this is all false. So instead of just adding a blurb at the end of it saying the CIA denies any of this stuff, the, the agreement they have with the CIA is if they disagree with it, they say it's false, 
they cannot publish it. So they kibosh the whole story. So first of all, you don't know if there's an agreement or not if it's not a written agreement. So somebody told you somewhere you got the idea that there's an agreement, but you never actually saw an agreement. So that's not vetted information. Well, that's what the editor said. They have The editor told him on the phone that they have an agreement mm. with them. So either way, there's if they have an agreement, that's the editor's call. That's a business owner's call. And I don't blame him. You know what I would, if I was the chief editor, the editor in chief of the New York Times or whatever the hell, Washington Post, or whatever it was, the last thing I want to do is publish a story that's then going to blow back and make me look like I'm yeah. an ass with evidence that's contrary to what the author just wrote and whatever else. And look, I understand, I understand the, it's important to keep covert ops off the front pages of the newspaper. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that he, he had a single source piece of information. He had Jack Murphy saying, this is what happened. And Jack Murphy bringing those 12 to the table. That's not the same so, as independent corroboration. Sorry, that's exactly right. It, it might've, listen, it probably happened, right? It probably happened, but there's no pussy ass editor of the New York times. that's going to sit there and say, oh, let's go. I'm a fucking courageous warrior. Fuck. He's gonna Bring like, me one piece of corroborative oh, information. Wreck my fucking life. Professional journalists. Close back. You know? Truly professional journalists are saying, I need corroborative information. Yeah. I can't take a single source. A single source that brings me 12 other sources could all be- He didn't have, He had multiple, right? He had over 12 sources. He but, but brought them. He brought them to the table. They weren't independently corroborated. Correct. Through their own- The editor-in-chief didn't go do it, exactly. The editor talked to each one of those sources directly. They were brought by Jack Murphy. That's, that's so that's, okay. the, he's, the, he's the developing thread. guy. He's bringing those. Right, we're well, talking about right, is, but in fairness, the editor's only Jack source Murphy's. was the current deputy director. Bingo. Yeah. So he had one. Whose job is to keep covert action off the front page of the newspaper. So what would you do if you were the editor-in-chief? I would do the same thing. Then it's not but a- do you think that's a good thing? Let's go back to the original mm. question. Your original question was, how do you feel about secret government agencies controlling the narrative? There was no secret government agency controlling the narrative. It was an editor-in-chief choosing not to publish a story. Yeah. It was not secret government agency controlling the narrative. You see the difference? It is in a, it's not in a direct way, but it is in an indirect way. The, the, the government agency wasn't controlling it at all. The, the editor could have made his own call. He could have risked his career. He could have risked his paycheck. He could have done anything he wanted to, but he didn't. That's not because CIA said no. The CIA, in fact, according to your own story, what the deputy director said is all of this is false. Mm -hmm. If, if the editor in chief had enough evidence that he was like, I actually have tons of evidence that this is true. Go forward. Now I'm going to go forward with it anyways yeah. and say that the direct, that the CIA didn't have no comment. CIA said it was a it was lie. False. Yeah. And we have all this proof that it wasn't. That's so, an even better story. So, so here's the other thing here, and I That's can't speak on the specifics of this because I haven't talked to Jack about it or something, but we'll throw this out there. So when I had Joby Warwick on the podcast, who's been the national security reporter at the Washington Post for a long, one of them, for a very long time, great guy, great reporter. He was actually very open about the difficulty of some of these conversations that happen in the back room when it involves foreign policy related stuff Absolutely. and events. And what he said is that almost that, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but a significant amount of the time you will have the CIA people or sometimes maybe the NSA or something else say on the phone, if you put to every story, almost every story, if you put this out, American lives are going to be at stake and people are going to die. And he said, we don't know shit. We're just reporting what we can find. So we have to go back in the room because it's not like we can quash all of them. Sometimes we got to publish, right? And we try. We would like to publish all of them if we can get the right burden of proof. But we have to have these impossible conversations mm -hmm. that don't get any easier over time where we got to say, do we believe them or don't we? Right. Mm -hmm. Fuck if I know how I would deal with that conversation. That's why you're not the journalist. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's the journalist's right. cross to bear. Yeah. They, Truly. It, like, if you're going to be an investigative journalist and you're going to be investigating that topic, it's like the police officers have to investigate domestic homicides mm -hmm. or child pornography or anything else. They put themselves in a position yeah. where they have to carry the burden of the evidence that they're, that they're dealing with. Right? He could be a journalist for fucking recipe books if he wants to be, but he's choosing that. So he has to deal with that decision. He's the one that has to go to bed at night wondering if it's right or whether right. it's wrong. It's still not the national security body of the United States controlling the public narrative. Do you think that a lot of the 
a lot of the negative narratives about the CIA. I mean, look, there's things that every organization makes huge mistakes. CIA has certainly had theirs over time that are provable. But the overall, you know, fuck the CIA narratives about everything. And, it, of course, about the FBI, too. But I'm more focused on the CIA We're for this question. You out. Everybody hates <laughs> Like, I'm more focused on the question for this one for the CIA because it's a little more international. Do you think a lot of that emanates from manipulation of foreign powers who want to see the CIA a lot weaker? No. 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 That, the CIA's reputation is very well earned. But it mm. was very well earned prior to 2003. Why do you pick... Right. Pre-9-11 CIA was completely different than post-9-11 CIA. Why do you say 2003? Chaos. Because 2003 was when the... Iraq? No, 2003 was when the Senate or the, when the Congress released the 9/11 investigative oh, the right. report. Oh yeah. right, yeah. yeah, yep. Right, once that came out, and and the legislative body of the United States got engaged, and they were like, CIA, FBI, you fucked up. You should be ashamed. Yep, you better get together. Yep, you better fix this. You need to triple your workforce. You need to coordinate. We're going to create this position called the DNI. We're going to get you guys organized. Intelligence reform. Get to work. That's a completely different agency than it was before that. Before that, it ran on it ran on half as many people who were focused on half as many things with half as much funding. So, like the the shit CIA, the the Bay of Pigs CIA, the let's try to ruin you know Castro's beard CIA, the MK Ultra CIA. They earned they earned that right. They made all those mis they all all those decisions, all those mistakes. If you want to, even if you want to take it out of context of time, which I think is always important to remember the context yeah, of the time. Yeah, yeah. If you take it out of context and you want to hate on CIA, that's cool. But at least be fucking man enough to accept that the CIA you hated is 50 years old mm. and that you haven't even given the new CIA a chance to prove itself. And the same thing is true with same FBI. Bureau. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, we, we just talked about it. You know, who did we have working these important matters? Because they weren't important matters in our minds. Pre. We had, I mean, all those all those stories, you know, the John O'Neill and and, and yeah. not cooperating and being the guy he was, I think mm -hmm. was over the over the top on Looming Tower. I mean, I don't think he was that guy, but um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah, we really just we were competing. We were competing to get that oh, I know case that, yeah. Yeah, done that quicker, right? So when we were then told, nope, not going to work this way, it was, didn't mean people were like, oh, great, how are you? Yeah, it still was different. It still was like. Sure. Fuck you, fuck you, based based on who you knew. If you had somebody that you enjoyed working with and trusted yeah. inherently, then you worked with them. Yeah, you, you also didn't. had a lot of friends across like all the agencies because yeah. of your previous career before. Yeah, that. yeah. So you I had mean, a little bit of a unique situation, no? I would say, but I think it's still about that nurturing of being a, we, we taught being a giver, mm -hmm. right? Not being a taker. Yep, right. You know, so it's, let me, let me do Always, every conversation of mine ends with, "What can I do for you?" Yep. You know, you let me you, do what yep. I do well. Yep. For you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes that goes a long way, not only in our past careers, mm -hmm. but clearly what's going on in our future, you know, endeavors, business wise. Yeah. Look at you guys. You guys have invited us back here together. This is our second time. You've invited both of us back to your podcast multiple times. Why? Because we share. Yep. We give. Right. Mm -hmm. We try to make you look good. We try to make sure that your questions are answered. Like we want to pour everything we have into you, into your audience, into your podcast, into your success. We're doing it intentionally. It's, it could be the fucking Jim and Andy show when we sit around talking how awesome we are, but we don't. Instead, you're driving the conversation. You know your audience. You know what you want to talk about. You know what would make a difference. So let's let us do what we do best and just help you do what you're trying to achieve also. Totally, this is. Man. It's not how most of government works. And it's most certainly not how the government worked before 9-11 when everybody was just trying to protect their small little pot of money, their little fiefdom. It's, it, it, it's not that hard to understand when you think of it like a normal person. You make a certain amount of money every year. You choose how to divvy that money up. You, you know how many, time, how many hours you have in a day. You choose how to spend those hours. Some people spend their hours at the gym. Some people spend their hours behind a computer. Some people spend their hours watching TV. Some people spend their hours reading. Some people spend their hours with family. You can't criticize other people for how they spend their hours. You can't criticize FBI. You can't criticize CIA for how they spent their dollars and their hours prior to 9-11 when they were operating on their own. Now, once 9-11 happened, unifying act, singular enemy, guess what we started doing with our dollars and our hours? Right. Pulling them up, baby. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that is 
fantastically well explained. I mean, Before we get off too far off talking about going back to the uh, the CIA control thing and the media thing, you tell the story way better than I do because you remember it a lot better. But what was the story with Tom O'Neill when he was going to meet a reporter? Oh yeah, yeah. So Tom O'Neill, who you had on a while back, but he wrote that book back there, oh, Chaos, Chaos, that I was yeah. pointing out to you earlier. Kind of the Manson started with the, the story Manson. of the Manson family. I don't remember okay. what Biblios, the information yeah. was that he had, but in the course of his investigation, he uncovered classified documents that were related to something with the cia i can't remember exactly what it was but he goes to the washington post and he doesn't tell their chief editor that he has this information meaning i have the answers to the test mm -hmm. right he wants to go see because he was a little bit naive because he had never gone into like a rabbit hole like this type of investigation it, it wasn't like he had been investigating like cia stuff his whole career or anything so he's feeling it out and so he says to her how much do you trust your chief cia sources hmm. and she said oh inherently you know they they can't they can't tell she was realistic like they can't tell us everything and obviously there's some questions that are just no goes but when we ask them things like yeah i, I would vouch I, I think they're very very honest with us and he said okay can we go ask them about X, Y, and Z? And X, Y, and Z had to do what was on those papers that he had. And so they, they he goes up to the office, the editor gets her guys on the phone, they're all talking, chit-chatting, laughing, having a good time. And so she goes, hey guys, um, I have Tom O'Neill here with me. He has ba 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 question. Can you guys discuss this in, in more detail or let us know if you did X, Y, or Z. And basically they go, oh, yeah, yeah. And they start explaining the whole thing like very nonchalantly. Oh, here's what we did. Yeah, no, that wasn't true. We didn't do that part, but we did this. And she hangs up the phone and, and he says, okay. He pulls out the documents and he goes, I got news for you. Those guys lie to you. Here's the, here's the proof. Now, also to defend the guys on the CIA phone there. And this is the issue with being a journalist and trying to you know, it's like going through right. a, a minefield trying to figure out what's true and what's not. It's not their job to tell you the truth. They have classified shit that could have a whole lot of other stuff behind it. Sometimes it, it might not, and they could be assholes for not telling you, but I don't know that. There could be, like like when they say Americans may die, they might be 100% right about that, right? So it's this, it's a very difficult thing, but I understand what you're why, why you're bringing that up, Danny, because, you know, it's like, well, if they'd lie that easily and make someone believe that they've been telling them the truth for so long, what does that say about the rest of the media? Because this is the Washington Post, which is like, you know, a preeminent longtime staple of the media in America with a lot of, you know, people working there who took many years to be able to even get that job. The problem here is sourcing. That's that's what I heard. Likewise. The problem is sourcing. What makes you think somebody with access to classified information who's voluntarily giving classified information to a newspaper is a credible source. That Fair question. Like this is, this is the biggest challenge in our, in our field of work is, is verifying credible sources. It's also the biggest challenge in journalistic, in the journalistic community. Right. You've got to vet your sources and it's very hard to do that because you, you also can't pay your sources. Right. So it's like, what kind of person is sworn to secrecy given government secrets and then voluntarily for free shares those secrets on an anonymous basis only with a major newspaper. Right. Just start thinking about the psychography, the, the uh, psychologic profile of that person. They don't really want the money, but they do want the attention, but they don't want their name associated with the attention. And they don't want to appear like they don't know the answer because they want to keep getting the calls back so that they can. Now you're, that's a built in fabricator right there. Yep. That's why whenever I see references in media to unnamed CIA sources, unnamed FBI sources, I'm like, you either got you either got somebody who's fabricating because they're a fucking failure at their real job. And that's why they're on here and they're excited because they know, oh, that place in the Washington Post that's where me. it says anonymous, that's, <laughs> that's me. me. I'm sticking it to the yep. man. Yeah. Well, Telling their wife, oh, look at what I do. Yeah, but in Tom O'Neill's case, he had the actual CIA documents. So, so then it was a game of gotcha with the assets, right? Yeah. He didn't well, even no, need them. exactly what it was. He didn't yeah. even need them, yeah. right. right? All he did was highlight to the lady. He was trying to point out yes. to the lady, right? Right. And like, that's, you should I, really check your sources. Exactly right. And, and when you, as soon as you started saying in the story that she was like, oh, I really feel like I can trust these guys. <laughs> you know what you will never hear a CIA or FBI officer say is, I feel. Yeah. I feel like I definitely can trust <laughs> them. They're just nice. They're good people. No. You know?
I feel you won't, like, yeah, you'll, I feel like we'll be like, sometimes they tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Other times they lie. We've corroborated this. We haven't corroborated that. 50% mm -hmm. of the time we can find a secondary source. That's 50%. the key, man. That corroboration and just being able to feel, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But when you know you have somebody that's telling you the truth, you know it. You I would really it. love to see both of you guys do a deep dive together, whether it be on another video or on your channel or something, like a deep dive analysis of the Twitter files and get your opinion on that. I am super interested in that now. We'll so you guys that. have referenced it yeah. so many times and yeah. I kind of look at it and I'm like, what were these emails going back and forth? Yeah, I didn't think it was that, you know, I didn't think they were that surprising. I don't think it's great at all. I, I, I think it's problematic, but I would... You I, also have to look at context again too, guys. What, what were the years? What were the years of the Twitter files? everything leading up to when he took over the company right yeah yeah yeah, yeah it went yeah. all the way back to yeah. back like a decade probably. oh wow yeah. give me okay. a year give me a starting year you can roughly, probably look it up Stephen. roughly when trump was becoming a like was president right so what else was happening in, at the same time leading up to the election what else was happening at the same time guys the whole world was afraid of covid 14 we took a 14 15 15, no, 16, no, 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 no. This is more, frame? this is when he was, I believe, we'll check, Stephen, please check it. But like, I believe it was more like when he was already president. Also, I wouldn't there trust There may have been stuff that right. went back, but. Um, okay, that, let's yeah, read the top part. Let's yeah. read the top part. The Twitter files are a series of in a, uh, internal Twitter documents that were published 20, 2022, 2023. Documents include emails, Slack chats between Twitter employees discussing company before policy. The before the 2020 election. election. Okay, yeah. so, gotcha. So from 2016 to 2020, you had the whole, from 2015 to 2020, you had the whole world waking up to the fact that Russia meddled in the elections. Yes. And that Russia meddled in the elections using social media. Yes. So the whole world, every government agency in the United States was extremely focused on how do we prevent additional meddling in social media? It's it's 9-11 all over again, only with a different focus. But now they, they're very focused on social media has no regulation, has no left and right boundaries, has no uh, no a law abiding requirement for, for authentication. And it's an active tool of Russian meddling and probably Iranian meddling and Chinese meddling. Everything, everyone. Yeah. But we think that now in 2023, we look at that and we're like, oh, that's obvious. And right. then they that is not, the real story. It was yeah. not obvious yeah. in 2014. It was not obvious in 2015. And then you had idiots from my organization, Strzok and you know, uh, McCabe and all those people that just facilitating that belief. Facilitating it. So by, that would make- By texting each other. Yeah, about, I, would feel, I would feel better. Canada, like Canada. I don't like having you- comment too deeply on stuff that you haven't had a chance to review fair, yet yeah. with stuff like that i'd feel better like really talking about it once you've done that yeah. and you may have some of the same answers by the way i yeah, don't know yeah. but i i get what you're saying with with some fears my issue reading through those and again i say for me it wasn't that big a deal because nothing surprised me in there it was it was all an issue but like to me it was it's crazy to have confirmation though. yeah we don't like we don't even want people talking about these things period regardless of who they are and that's always a problem mm. because it go that that's where like that's where a precedent of something with that's different like a stellar win could actually get to where it is a problem for people to be able to give their opinion or be like you were talking mm. about earlier you get jailed in thailand if you say something against the royal family this isn't there let's be clear about that but this is that slippery slope mm -hmm. that could go there. Mm. You We're know, when, 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 you, yeah. when you have the, and, it, and in fairness, like they caught both White Houses doing this. They caught Trump yes, and Biden's exactly. White House is doing this. Yep. When you have, I don't give a fuck who's in power. When you have a White House, e like not even agencies, the White House, mm -hmm. elected officials emailing a social media company saying, what are we doing about person X? Which is, you know, that's straight out of the recordings you used to listen to. What are we doing about fucking, you know, little Paulie over there? Oh, yeah. You know, you he's look, gone. How'd you like to have that, Jeff? And then right. you see that it happened, and they did do it. That's a problem. Hmm. But again, I, yeah, I want we, you to actually, yeah. look, it's yeah, not fair to like- I would be interested to look into it. Yep. Yeah. But uh, like on a similar vein, though, one thing we haven't talked about today that I wanted to make sure we get to is the AI stuff. Hmm. Because obviously, like, that's exploded in- awareness popularity this year but it's not new like they've been working on this for right. years and years and years you were there 27 uh, 2007 to 2014 you were fbi all the way up until 2018 so like i don't it's probably some form of a different answer but like is this something you came across in your career or it was discussed and there were potential you know 
those doors of possibility where you guys assess like confidence levels of how this is going to go? Like, did you have any see through to that or was that not really a part of anything you did? So it's important to understand that AI, like you said, has been around for a long time. It was called machine learning yeah. before it was called AI. Yep. It was called automation before it was called machine learning, right? Intelligent design. There's all sorts of things that, and I've absolutely, I was using tools in 2007 that were driven by machine learning. Really? Because machines learn faster than humans. Yeah. And with almost all cutting edge technology, the first investor is the US federal government, especially if the technology has any kind of benefit or application to national security, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I, I saw that myself in 2007. Were we estimating the confidence or the likelihood that AI would ever be whatever it's called when it becomes self-aware, right? Were we ever- Sentient. Yeah. Were we worried about sentient AI Conscious, coming yeah. over or taking over the taking over civilization nobody put any effort or time into that that does not have ra rational impact to national security but we were absolutely thinking about how could this kind of tool be used by a foreign adversary to do anything mm. from create false covert influence documentation deep fake videos deep fake audio i mean those conversations have been happening for long long before the, the capability was clear and present yeah because you've referenced Agreed. it in passing on previous podcasts about yeah. like how ubiquitous some of that stuff has been yeah. in your world for a long time. Because it, it's just fascinating that like, it seems like now in the public, there's an app for everything, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, a tool online, whatever it may be. And, you know, I like stopped looking at it for a couple of years because I was, I was really reading a lot about it in like 2017, 2018, 2019, like crazy. And I'm like, where is it? Mm. And I'm like, oh, maybe it's not coming. And then boom, it comes. I'm always like a little fascinated by that because it, it was it's almost like it's a planned rollout mm -hmm. you know and i don't think that's a product thing because if they've had it like it was a money ma it had to be a money maker for tech companies so like why are they are they waiting until 2023 to put it out and how much the real question is how much farther along like are they behind the scenes on this stuff mm. well <clears throat> I, the only experience i had 2013 so um and it you know, not to not to really talk about it, but it, clearly it was where it needed to be at that point. So, ten years ago. Ten, ten years, years ago. ago. So I mean, it was um, it was eye opening and uh, a little scary to be honest. Yeah, you know, I mean, you it's know, also so. yeah, it's super important, man, because you're also I don't know what you're mentally referencing as you recall your own experience with this. Mm -hmm. 2019, 2018, AI was all the talk of wealthy oil investors in mm -hmm. the Middle East. Really? That be that was, and it may still be, their primary investment vehicle to diversify themselves away from natural, natural gas. Oh, you were over oil. there at that time, exactly. right? You were living in the UAE, exactly. Interesting. So, so it seems to us that in American news, AI has only been talked about for the last year. Yeah. Back 2018, 2019, 2020, it was all the rage because the sheikhs started investing in it because they were trying to diversify their investment portfolios away from oil. Right, and it's been around for a long time. Government contractors have been using AI to create law enforcement and intelligence tools since 2010, before mm, that even. Exactly. Right. Thirteen was. So you know, it's right where it's at. This um, is another example of what's called the availability heuristic. We recall things, and then we give more value to the things that we recall easier. That's actually not cognitively yeah. or rationally a good thing to do. It's mm. a shortcut. We're like, oh yeah, I just thought this, I, I heard three stories about this in the last week. It must be a problem. No, it just means you heard, you remember three stories about it in the last week. Yeah, and that's why, look, you know, everyone out there listens and makes their own decisions about stuff. But even, even with that, you know, when you're listening to experts talk on things and they're talking on long form too, there's going to be stuff they don't know about that then maybe they're forced to talk about and all that information comes out mm -hmm. and what if it is true? Yeah. I mean, you watched me get caught earlier with the article I read right. on that. You know, I'm not an expert, to be clear. I always said I'm a fucking podcaster. But like, <laughs> I'd like to not have a mistake like that. Right. It still happens. Oh, that's yeah. not the first time that's happened. You know, and like, that's why we have Stephen here checking it. Like, I love that. But, you know, there's so many people who I'll listen to where I'm like, damn, they're really saying this with such command of it. I, how do I even check some of that? Yep. You know, and, and AI is one of many things, but, you know, the, the implications of that, like when you start talking about like consciousness or like, God forbid, like sentient, which is like way down there, 
that's where it's you start to get to questions you can't even possibly answer like well what does that mean for humanity do we morph with them you know yeah, yeah, yeah. it's i i don't love thinking about that stuff because that is so many decision tree iterations away from where we are right now it's like i fuck, will say that know? i i look forward to ai i think it's it brings more net benefit than net danger or net harm and Agreed. i absolutely think that if we don't do it our adversaries will oh and they are they're outpacing already, to be honest. So you can't stick your head in the sand and be afraid of evolution. It's yeah. not something you can do. Nope. You got to embrace it, adapt, and roll with it, right? Otherwise, we just become the old guys that don't know how to use a cell phone, mm. right? We can't let that happen. We can't let that happen on a national level for sure. Are you Truth. Are you going to be putting out a book at any point? Like, are you working on something? Are you allowed to talk about that? Uh, I I am. So I've got a book that's in the, I've got a manuscript that's actually under review right now with PCRB, with the, with the CIA's review board. And we're aiming for a summer release next year. I'm not going to tell many more details okay. than that because I know the publisher is going to want to do a proper promotion. Right. But yeah. And then shortly on the heels of that, I've got another book coming out one year later. Same publisher, second book. Two book deal. Two book deal. So that, and that's autobiographical. One is one is uh, my personal operational memoir, which is why it's got to go through PCRB. Got the it. second is basically the process that I use to bring spy skills into business and build my business. So, spy. so once it gets through review, some of the content in there that you may be revealing for the first time, you'll be able to talk about. But right now, Correct. you still can't talk about. Exactly it. right. right. Okay. Exactly right. We're, I'm gonna, I'm give gonna them first right of review. Got it. Okay. So, point being. There may be some things next year that people learn about your perspective. On, and my operations. Yeah. That's the thing I'm the most, I've never been able to talk about my operations. Yeah. Right. And it's really only been developments in the last three to five years that have made it even close to the place where I'm not laughed off the stage when I write CIA email and say, hey, I'd kind of like to have my, my operational background reviewed for disclosure. Got Give me it. the details, Andy. Yeah, I want them all. We've been, we've all. been debating them for years. That's how I started out the last podcast. Have you ever killed anybody? Yeah, that was <laughs> the one, best, of the best, best one of the best things ever. History of podcasts. We don't call it murder. <laughs> Close, I, I like, closed casket like, versus I love open Andy, casket. Andy like points, right? Exactly. Yes, yes. Right. what he call, said. Don't call it murder. What he said. I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was like the Spider-Man meme where we're all looking around. Yeah, like pointing at each other. <laughs> But I, I, I don't know. Let his head down nicely. You got, you got anything else for him? Wait, my book. I want to talk about my book. <laughs> yeah, let's talk Julian, about it. Julian has ripped my characters. That's as far as I got. Fictional series. Remember? <laughs> oh, that's like, right. What are you doing? Well, we're not talking about that yet. We're oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. My bad. I said Take the that out. Redacted. Yeah. Redacted. <laughs> redacted. Redacted. <laughs> redacted. Diorio, redacted. Well, boys, it's been a fun fucking weekend hanging out with you guys. Oh, man. Yeah, man. You're not kidding. Loved Thank it. You. Did we? Is there anything you guys wanted to talk about that we didn't? I feel like we covered a lot. We covered a lot, man. Covered a lot. If Everyday more Spy than, Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. The Everyday Spy Podcast. You'll find it on YouTube. You'll find it on all of your favorite podcast channels. And of course, you can find me at Everyday Spy or at EverydaySpy.com. And we're going to go record a video for your channel right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, wait, wait. Julian Dory Podcast and then Oop. Jim. Well, Diorio right now is in transition. So you'll hear more uh, in the next couple months. Got it. And then your right, podcast is now... The oh, Jones we're on. Podcast. Oh, yeah, we're on Julian. I forgot we're part two. We're on probably Jones. now we're on my channel. I don't know yeah, how it's yeah, going to yeah. work yet, but your podcast is Danny Jones Podcast. Danny Jones we will Podcast. Have part one of this, if that's how we end up doing the order, linked down in the description. So go check that out. Check out his whole library as well. This was the first guy to have Bustamante oh, yeah. on. So it was fun, fellas. Really fun, man. It's awesome. going to be awesome coming up with the plan to top this weekend the next time we get together. Yeah, Boken, so. baby. I think we can next do it. Next year in Boken. 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 Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. All right, guys. That takes us to the end of part two of our two-episode series with Andy and Jim. The first part, if you haven't seen it, was on Danny Jones' podcast, so you can check out that channel, and please subscribe to it by hitting the link in the description below. And if you haven't already subscribed to this channel and like this video, please hit that subscribe button. Please smash that like button, and I will see you guys for the next episode.